afternoon begin. Make notes of questions you might have at the end. Hopefully we'll have time for Q&A. Would you join me in welcoming Jane Cahill West? Um, there we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Mark Lanier and Jim Hoffmeyer again for inviting me to speak here today. I, I feel very privileged. I'd also like to thank the late Egal Shilo, who you see pictured here, who hired me to work at his excavations in the city of David, and Mendel Kaplan, who led the group of philanthropists who sponsored those excavations. But for their faith in me, I would not be here today. The city of Jerusalem has been occupied continuously for at least 6,000 years. It has played a prominent role in world history, and it is one of the world's most extensively excavated sites. Nevertheless, the historical record is scant, and the archaeological remains are fragmentary, difficult to excavate, and only partly published. The many unresolved questions about Jerusalem's historical development have generated and continue to generate bitter debates among scholars trying to draw factual conclusions from bodies of evidence that will always be incomplete and subject to change. Therefore, I cannot present a definitive picture of the city even as it existed during only the single period of the United Monarchy. No one can. But I can, however, present the features from which Jerusalem's development must be reconstructed and my interpretation of what those features reflect about the period of the United Monarchy. And for purposes of, Jer of Jerusalem, that's the time of David and Solomon, who are believed to have ruled from about 1050 to 930 BCE. In archeological terms, this is the transitional period from the Iron Age I to the Iron Age IIa. However, many features that characterize Jerusalem of this time originated long before in the Middle Bronze Age. Ancient Jerusalem spread across two rocky ridges surrounded by steep valleys. Because the Gihon Spring, the only perennial source of fresh water in the immediate vicinity, lies in a cave located at the foot of the eastern ridge, Jerusalem's earliest settlement was located there. Archaeologists too numerous to name have excavated on the eastern ridge, and many claim to have found remains dating to the United Monarchy. Some of the best-known excavations were conducted by R.A.S. McAllister and J.G. Duncan in the 1920s, Kathleen M. Kenyon in the 1960s, Nachman Avigad and Benjamin Mazar following Jerusalem's unification in 1967, Egal Shilo from 1979 to 1985, and most recently, Roni Reich and Eli Shukron, Elat Mazar, and Daron ben -Ami. Each of these excavations have demonstrated an important point about Jerusalem's site formation process. The archaeological composition conforms to a pattern common in the central hill country, where buildings were constructed of stone rather than mud brick. Ancient builders at these sites commonly dug to bedrock in an effort to secure both firm foundations and building materials. This practice prevented the buildup of superimposed strata characteristic of tells. Consequently, the best preserved structures in Jerusalem, as at other hill country sites, are those last constructed, with earlier remains preserved only when exploited or avoided by later builders. Moreover, public infrastructure such as city walls and water supply systems remained in use for very long periods of time. Infrastructure that originated in the Bronze Age and remained in use through the period of the United Monarchy includes the monumental fortification wall uh, seen at the middle of this photograph built above a steep scarp in the bedrock located about midway between the hill crest and the valley floor. Its earliest phase dates to the Middle Bronze Age II in about the 18th century BC. Buttressing added during the Middle Bronze Age widened the wall, and most importantly for us, covered remains of Middle Bronze Age structures that have been preserved only because the wall and the buttressing occupy the same line as that followed almost 1,000 years later when the fortification wall was rebuilt at the beginning of the Iron Age II. 
Other features used continuously from the Bronze to the Iron Age include the Gijon Spring, fortifications built around it, and tunnels connected to it. Because the Gijon is a karstic spring whose flow is not only pulsating instead of constant, but also weakens during the dry summers, settlement demanded a reliable system for storing and distributing water. Evidence from Reich and Schukron's excavations demonstrates that the earliest subterranean water supply system was this deep trench hewn in the bedrock capped by enormous partly dressed stones known as Channel 2 or the Siloam Channel. Until just a few years ago, this channel was dated to the Iron Age too. But Reich and Schukron's excavations revealed that an enormous tower connected to an enclosed passageway was built over Channel 2 no later than the Middle Bronze Age. Since Channel 2 runs under the tower, it undoubtedly predated the tower. Its attribution to the Middle Bronze Age is based both on its stratigraphic position and on the similarity of its capstones to the stones used to build the tower. The tower and passageway are believed to have projected east of the Middle Bronze Age city wall and to have surrounded not only the spring, but a rock-cut pool to which water was diverted from Channel 2. Channel 2 carried spring water south along the slope to a reservoir located somewhere in the Kidron Valley, often identified with the waters of Shiloh that go softly, mentioned in Isaiah 8.6. Channel 2, like the city wall, remained in use until the Iron Age II when it was replaced by Tunnel 8, also known as Hezekiah's Tunnel in the 8th century BC. Various excavations show that during the early Iron Age, this massive, technically complex stepstone structure was built on the slope above and north of the Gijon Spring. The stepstone structure consists of a substructure and a superstructure linked by a rubble core. The substructure is formed by a series of interlocking terraces consisting of rows of rectangular compartments filled with stones covered by soil. The mantle is built of roughly dressed boulders laid in stepped courses rising at a 45 degree angle. Kenyon and Shiloh interpreted the substructural terraces as a freestanding feature dated to the late Bronze Age based on the presence of imported pottery in the soil and stone fills, like this, uh, Cypriot pottery, and on Kenyon's attribution of building remains found beneath the fills to the Middle Bronze Age. Since, however, pottery from the floor of the building that Kenyon found beneath the fills contained this cholera-ridden storage jar, and the latest pottery recovered from the fills is universally dated to the phase between the Late Bronze Age and the Iron Age, the terrace fills could not have been laid before the first half of the Iron Age I, or the 12th century BC. Consensus concerning the date of the stepped mantle remains elusive and highly controversial. McAllister and Duncan discovered its uppermost courses and attributed them to the pre-Israelite period. Skeptical of that day, Kenyon dismantled roughly coarse masonry that she thought belonged to the mantle, beneath which she found remains of this Iron Age house with monolithic pillars. She concluded that the mantle post-dated the Iron Age. The house with monolithic pillars is known today as the four-room House of Achiel. Since no one doubted Kenyon's conclusion that the step mantle covered this house, this stepped masonry found beneath its floors was not readily identified as part of the step mantle. Today, however, it is undisputed that the house of Achiel and its northern neighbor, the Burnt Room House, were built on and into the stepped mantle. Because pottery recovered from soil fills found covering the step mantle and underlying the house of Achiel included red slipped hand burnished swords, conventionally dated to the 10th century, Egal Shiloh dated the mantle accordingly to the 10th century. Since, however, that pottery was recovered from soil layers found covering the mantle, it's useful for dating the mantle's final or last use, but not its date of construction. Stratigraphically secure evidence for dating the mantle's construction was found in probes cut into areas that were undisturbed by later building. For example, here beneath the house of Achiel, mantle stones were removed and a vertical section was cut. 
The vertical section shows that the step mantle sealed the rubble core and the soil and stone filled terraces. Because pottery found in the rubble core is identical to pottery found in the substructural terraces, and because the latest pottery found there dates to the Iron Age one, the step mantle, the rubble core, and the substructural terraces all belong to a single structure built during the Iron Age one. Although its full extent is not known, all agree that the rampart originally included this step masonry found by Kathleen Kenyon at the center of this trench that she dug from the hill crust to the middle Bronze Age city wall midway between the hill crust and the valley floor. And that her discovery of the rampart thus far down slope suggests that it reached the city wall, thus spanning a height of over 120 feet or 12 stories. The stepstone structure is best interpreted as a rampart skirting a palace temple complex built on the hill crust, best identified with the Jebusite citadel of Zion. Support for this interpretation comes from fragments of cultic stands recovered from the soil layers found covering the step mantle. One such stand was decorated with this figure of a naked man with a pointed beard and flowing hair. Based on comparisons to scenes such as this one on a stone relief from Tel Halaf in Syria, depicting the slaying of the giant Humbaba by the hero Gilgamesh, the late Perhia Beck of Tel Aviv University identified the figure on this cultic stand as Humbaba and interpreted the stand as having depicted a Syrian version of the myth of Gilgamesh. Also recovered from Phil's found covering the mantle was this one and a half inch long bronze fist which once served as the right hand of a statuette estimated to have been approximately 14 inches tall. Based on comparisons to albeit smaller figurines, Shilo reconstructed the fist as having belonged to a smiting god statuette like those found at sites such as Rashamra on the Mediterranean coast. Structural remains plausibly identified as a palace temple complex on the hill crest have been recovered by Lot Mazar. Mazar's removal of large stones left by McAllister and Duncan revealed a building of massive proportions that she calls the large stone structure. The building was at least 6,000 square feet in size and appears to have included a large open courtyard with a chalk floor. The structure's massive eastern wall was built directly on bedrock. It's preserved to a height of almost six feet at least two and possibly three undisturbed stratum of occupational remains have been found against the wall's inner west face. The pottery from these layers spans the latter part of the Iron Age I. At its northern end, the building's east wall stood above a vertically hewn rock scarp that is 25 feet high, making the structure's eastern wall at least 30 feet tall. South of the vertical rock scarp, the east wall was bonded to the stepped mantle, proving that the two structures were contemporary. That part of the eastern wall bonded to the step mantle is seen here, and it's over 20 feet wide. In some areas, the floors of the large stone structure were laid directly on top of remains from the late Bronze Age, evidenced not only by local Canaanite pottery, but also by sherds of imported Cypriot pottery pictured here. Thus, the large stone structure is not only bonded to the stepstone structure, but like the stepstone structure, is built directly on top of remains from the late Bronze Age. This stratigraphy thus provides sound evidence for dating its construction to the Iron Age I. Mazar, however, identifies the large stone structure as a palace built for King David and by King David and dates its construction to the first half of the Iron Age II or the 10th century BCE. Her excavations outside the North Wall produced evidence for additional phases of Iron Age occupation that reached the very end of that period of the Babylonian destruction in 586 BCE. Dozens of late Iron Age bulla, or the little clay seals seen in the corner here, found a short distance east of the large stone structure suggests that the structure not only remained in use throughout the Iron Age II, but also retained a public function throughout that period. A step mantle, however, remained in use only until the beginning of the Iron Age II, when the House of Achiel and the Burnt Room House were built over and into it, 
suggesting that the rampart was purposely dismantled to accommodate their construction. The earliest floor in the burnt room house, seen here, yielded a ceramic assemblage comparable to that from Arad 12 in Kirbet Kayafa and, and pieces of an imported Cipro-Phoenician flask. Immediately above that floor is a floor dated to the 9th century by an assemblage of typologically similar pottery that included a sherd from a Cipro-Phoenician black on red juglet seen down in the right-hand corner. A similar stratigraphic sequence has been defined all along the city of David's eastern slope in areas excavated both inside and outside the fortification wall. The best evidence of this sequence found inside the fortification wall come from Shiloh's area E, and the best evidence from outside the wall comes from his area D. Evidence of the Iron 2A in area E includes a small area interpreted as a cultic corner based on the presence of the lower half of this fenestrated offering stand and these two ceramic chalices. The best evidence of this, ceramic sequence, or this stratigraphic sequence found outside the wall comes from area D1, where on the rock ledge east of a natural cave, Shiloh unearthed a series of five superimposed layers of debris two meters deep containing large quantities of animal bones and pottery. While evidence for the extramural quarter demonstrates that settlement spread east beyond the Middle Bronze Age at least as early as the 10th century, when settlement expanded north and west is controversial. When Kenyon discovered this Palmette capital and a structure identified as a segment of casemate wall a short distance north of the stepped rampart, she interpreted them as evidence that Solomon expanded the city's fortifications to encompass the Temple Mount. Kenyon's interpretation of these finds found few followers. However, in recent years, Elat Mazar has managed to identify pockets of Iron Age II remains preserved at the deepest levels of her grandfather's excavation south of the Temple Mount at the top of this photograph. There, Mazar has identified a gatehouse comprised of a four-chamber inner gateway. There's no doubt that the complex was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC, but there's no consensus about when it was built. Nevertheless, the construction date is indicated by the discovery of this small black juglet sheltered between the stones of the gateway's foundation courses. It's a type of juglet commonly dated to the Iron Age II when found at northern sites with ties to Phoenicia. The fact that fragments of similar juglets are now known for Kirbat Kayafa strengthens Mazar's construction date for this gate complex. Although controlled excavations have not yet been conducted on the Temple Mount, sifting of soil and debris removed during development activities has yielded a handful of potsherds attributed to this period. Evidence deduced from excavations in Jerusalem suggests this reconstruction of how the city looked at the end of the United Monarchy. Although neither the temple nor any royal buildings have been identified, they were presumably located on the summit or the Temple Mount and accessed through the monumental gateway discovered by Benjamin and investigated by Elat Mazar. South of there, the city of David would have retained many features from earlier periods to which new features were added. Features retained were infrastructural in nature. They include the Gihon Spring, the pool from which its waters were drawn, and its fortifications. Also retained from an earlier period, but altered to serve a new purpose was the stepstone structure. Designed to support a palace temple complex built during the Iron Age I, best identified as the Jebusite Citadel of Zion, the step mantle was partially dismantled to facilitate the construction of new houses in the 10th century. The size of the houses, known as the House of Achiel and the Burnt Room House, the quality of their construction, and the presence of imported pottery on their floors suggest that these houses were built and occupied by Jerusalem's wealthier residents. Moreover, when compared to the houses built in the extramural quarter farther down slope, the houses built on the mantle suggest a stratified society not previously evidenced in Jerusalem's archaeological record. The development of two residential quarters, one on the skirts of the palace temple complex and the other outside the city's fortification wall, suggests a secure period during which the city's population was rapidly outgrowing its boundaries. These features 
and the close correlation of the ceramic assemblages from the floors associated with this expansion to the assemblages from Arad 12 and Kirbet Kayafa strongly suggest that they represent the period of the United Monarchy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. While Steve Ortiz is getting mic'd up and ready to go, are you mic'd up? So we'll get your PowerPoint ready to go. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, for people who are still coming in, um, they need to, it'll be easier for them to sit if the folks in the center aisle can move over just a little bit. I know that I develop a rash if I'm not on an aisle seat. And if you're like that, um, we've got some medical care for you. Uh, so thank you. So Steve Ortiz is pulling his up. Um, I, I don't know if everyone is aware of this or not, but I want to make sure that you do know. One of the things that prompted our uh, weekend subject is the fact for the last 20 years or so, uh, at least, there's been a very directed attack on the biblical concept of Israel's origins, and that includes an attack on whether or not David was the king that we read about with the United Monarchy, um, or whether he was, as Israel Finkelstein said in a National Geographic write-up eight or nine years ago, uh, akin to Pancho Villa with maybe a few uh, uh, bandit friends, but hardly anything that would amount to a king. That view is, is very prevalent in much of academia. And, and uh, we've, we've brought together strong academicians to address that topic. So with that, Steve Ortiz. Thank, thank you, you, Mark. Uh, I want to thank Mark for organizing this and bringing us together and uh, most of all funding it to bring us all from uh, all over the US and out of the country. My purpose this morning is to coalesce the recent archaeological research in the South with the rereading of the biblical text to demonstrate that the northern Shrela was a key region in the expansion of Judah toward the coastal plain during the Iron Age II period. I will focus on the recent excavations at Kerbet Kayafa and Tel Gezer, as well as recent research trends in the transition between the Late Bronze Age and Iron Age I. So now you know my conclusion. I'm going to chase many rabbits, so you can remember where I had. Much has been written about state development in the United Monarchy, from placing the text within the historical and geographical context to applying various social scientific models to the accounts. While the majority have accounted for the biblical authors glorifying the United Monarchy and adding a theological overlay, e.g. the concept of kingship, God's anointed, most still place the development of the state in the 10th century BCE. I have to admit that I have participated in this restatement of the biblical text over my past several decades in my publishing. Concurrently with this research, especially during the 1980s, biblical st scholars started to question this view, as Mark stated, placing the state as late as the 8th century. In the 1990s, this critical view of the United Monarchy was adopted as there was an Iron Age chronological reevaluation that redated various strata from many sites. This has been commonly referred to as low chronology, popularized by Israel Finkelstein. Biblical scholars then took the results and proposed that David did not even exist. Now this view was short-lived with the discovery of the Beit David inscription. Archaeologists continue to, date, to debate the Iron Age chronology as it forced scholars to reevaluate state formation, particularly in Judah. The Iron Age debate has shifted as several scholars proposed place in the state of Judah in the ninth century or even later. Other scholars have countered these proposals and continue to argue for the conventional chronology, albeit noting that the biblical account of the United Monarchy could be exaggerated. Naturally, focus shifted to processional models to explain the growth of settlements between Iron Age I and Iron Age II. Today, various models either propose that the growth is from the Philistine expansion eastward, or as I hold to, the Judean expansion westward. I'll talk about some recent trends. 
These recent trends, these recent theories have gained prominence as several research projects in the Shrey Law have now added uh, data to the recent debate. Main trends are focusing on the LB Iron Age 1 tr transition, nature of the Philistine polity, the Canaanite enclave theory, an explosion of excavations in the foothills of Judah. These trends in research have provided new historical reconstructions between the archaeological record and the biblical text. The Albi transition, the Albi age in the Southern Levant corresponds to the period of the New Kingdom in Egypt and its control and dominance in the region. The discovery of the Amarna tablets and subsequent research has shown that the Southern Levant had several rulers of city-states each vying for territorial control with each other, yet while still under the hegemony of the Egyptian crown. Several studies on the Amarna tablets have noted that the Shrey La region played a critical role in Egyptian influence and interest. Other studies have addressed the social and political nature of late Bronze Age Canaan. Finkelstein and Jasmine each use a these and polygon model of site distribution and hierarchy to determine the nature of regional geopolitics. Finkelstein proposes that Gezer dominated an area up to 36 hectares. It quoted, and I quote, the entire width of the coastal plain from the hills to the sea. Jasmine notes that this territory is too large and disagrees with Finkelstein that Gezer controlled the coastal sites. Uh, this view is also supported by Gadot, who proposes that the Yarkon and Ireland Basin was annexed by Egypt during the 18th dynasty. It then became royal or temple land until rebellion breaks out after Ramses II and sites in this area are destroyed. He proposes that perhaps Gezer led this rebellion, which is why Merneptah claims to have destroyed Gezer and claims himself to be the subduer of Gezer. The nature of the Egyptian, re of Egyptian relationship in Rome and Palestine is still debated, specifically whether it was a colonial or imperial model. Nevertheless, all scholars agree that the Shrey Law was an integral focus of Egyptian activity, whether we call it direct rule or as Canaanite loyal, loyal to Egypt. Each city-state dominated a territory with several settlements. The Iron Age I period corresponds to the period of Israelite settlement and conquest. Naturally, research was dominated by questions addressing the nature of the relationship between the Philistines and the Israelites. The biblical texts, especially Israelite Southern Conquest and the Elah battle between David and Goliath, retained memories of this region serving as a buffer zone between the development of the two secondary states or regional polities. Archaeological investigations at Gath have shown that the Philistines occupied the southern coastal plain with large urban centers and Gath was perhaps one of the largest. During the Iron Age I period, the Shvela was settled by small rural groups that occupied a few sites. Talbatash, Bet Shemesh, Yarmouth, Talzafi, Tawiton, and Talbait Mersin. Uh, it experienced, the Iron Age I, it experienced an extreme settlement abandonment when we compare it to the earlier phase of the Late Bronze Age. This has led to a current proposal the Canaanite enclave theory. The Canaanite enclave theory postulates that there was a concentration of Canaanites who occupied the Trau Valley in the Shrey Law. Uh, Bunny Mowitz and Letterman, and I see Daryl Manor right here, who's one of the uh, key staff members in, uh, contributing to this, um, to this theory. <laughs> Contribution up, <laughs> still stands. <laughs> um, proponents of this theory not including Daryl Manor, note that there is a pattern of sites that do not exhibit the cultural markers of either the Philistines on the coast nor the Israelites in the hill country. Therefore, we should speak of the Shrey Law as a middle ground where changes in settlement pattern and layout in the early Iron Age indicate social fragmentation. Interesting in the conquest accounts, there are no battles in the northern district of the Shrey Law, perhaps an early memory of the Canaanite enclave in this region. Research in the Shrey Law. The Shrey Law is one of the most investigated regions in the Southern Levant. Several scholars have looked at the settlement data in the Shrey Law as part of the long durée in this region. Two, 
uh, Avi Faust and Ido, have proposed that the Spray Law was densely settled in the Late Bronze Age, it ex experienced a hiatus during the Iron Age I, and then was resettled starting in the 10th century and grew to its height in the 8th century. Others have proposed that the resettlement did not start until the 9th century, after the wane in Philistine dominance. Nevertheless, all scholars note that the Late Bronze Age settlement is influenced by Egyptian activity and policy over several centers, and that the, A, the collapse of the Egyptian New Kingdom and the Philistine expansion on the coast led to a settlement abandonment during the Iron Age I period. The next phase of settlement contains a growth of new, state, of new sites and the expansion of current sites. The question that is debated is what happened during this particular phase of settlement. There are three major theories. Either it was Judah, it was localized Canaanite chiefdoms and or polities, or to the westward expansion, to move the westward expansion not to the 10th century, but to the 9th century. Now I'll turn to recent excavations. Fortification of the monarchy. Perhaps one of the most exciting excavations have been Kirbet, has been Kerbet Kayafa. These excavations have revealed a previously unknown Iron Age fortified city dated to the 11th, 10th century BCE. The excavators have proposed that Kayafa is a fortified city built under the auspices of a centralized authority in, in Judah. Most would concur with this conclusion, although there have been some who have proposed that the centralized authority is farther north, i.e. King Saul in the Gibeon region, while others have proposed that the site belongs to the Philistines and represents this eastward expansion of the territory into the hills. I will save the discussion and complete analysis of the territory, uh, and complete analysis of this for our, our guest of honor, uh, Yossi Garfinkel, who will cover this in uh, tomorrow night's presentation. Now I'll, I'll turn to a more important site. No, I'm kidding. I've been, <laughs> been co-directing Gezer for the past 10 years, and we just finished our last season. Um, about a year ago. Uh, the Tandy Institute for Archaeology, as I said, has just concluded 10 seasons. It's under the direction of myself and my partner in crime, Dr. Sam Wolf. The current excavations are located on the southern part of the town within the saddle between the western and eastern hills. The excavations are designed to unite the Iron Age architectural elements and culture horizons of the HUC excavations with our renewed excavations. To date, the Tandy excavations has 13 major strata. Major results to date include verification and extension of the MB Glass Sea on the eastern slope of the Western Hill, a late Bronze Age patrician house, an Iron Age one city wall and complex of several structures, an Iron Age two monumental administrative city with a palace and a six-chambered gate, on top of this is the 9th century domestic quarter. The this shifts and we have a brand new 8th century administrative uh, city with three large administrative and industrial buildings. And then on top of all this, we have a Hellenistic phase. We have an active carbon-14 study and most of our dates uh, confirm uh, our conclusions. Just quickly to summarize, here you can see the excavations of this late Bronze Age palace. Uh, it's a typical LB building. And with this, we found uh, several cylinder seals, finds, uh, scarabs. Uh, most of the accumulation of artifacts dates it to the end of the um, New Kingdom period. And naturally, uh, the person left his calling card where Nepto talks about a campaign where he conquered Gezer. In fact, when he wants to brag back home, he calls himself the subduer of Gezer. And we think we have enough evidence of the carbon-14, the pottery, uh, the glyptic art to um, assign the destruction to Merneptah. This building is destroyed, and immediately we have a new city plan with a couple phases. Most of this pottery dates to the Iron Age I, and the last phase is contemporary with uh, Kerbet Kayafa, uh, the mid-10th century. Two major buildings, 
Uh, here you have one with several rooms, uh, typical lamp and bowl deposits. Uh, there's my son there, I had to put him in there. Um, he just started A&M. Thank you, I was waiting for, I'm learning this, this new coat that I'm now a part of. <laughs> And within this building, we have the typical um, Philistine bichrome pottery. This next transition, this building goes out of use. We don't have evidence of destruction. Um, and I'll come back to this verse uh, toward the end of my presentation. We have a new building built on top of this. This building was violently destroyed. Uh, and we're currently calling it a cultic building based on the finds. Uh, uh, the zoomorphic vessels, the um, phallic symbols, etc. Uh, and one of the unique features of this building are these uh, stoppers, clay stoppers. It's not unique, these are found in all, the, all over uh, Israel, major sites. It's the typical clay, uh, wet clay that you put to seal a store jar. Well, my colleague was reading an article and we didn't know this, but some of these clay stoppers have glyptic art or impressions or stamps on them. And so we pulled them out of storage. And again, they're so ubiquitous that we didn't analyze them. We just stored them uh, in our lab. He pulled them out and sure enough, we found on one of our storage jars part of this glyptic image. And this type of um, glyptics are common for Siamon. Now before this, we know in the biblical text that uh, Gezer was given to Solomon from the Egyptian Pharaoh. And most biblical scholars and historians uh, based on dead reckoning have associated this with Siamon. And so we think that this is a, a good connection that perhaps we have this um, one glyptic that's helping to date the destruction of the site to Siamon. And what's Important is after this, Iron Age 1 city is destroyed. We have a brand new city plan built on top with casemate walls, a six-chambered gate, stuff you're going to see at Kayafa in tomorrow's lecture. And next to the gate, we have this large palace. Uh, in the news, we call it the Solomon's Palace. And most of the dating dates to the end of the 10th century. These administrative palaces, complexes are common throughout the Iron Age, and this is just one of them, uh, showing that we have a new state, we have a new administrative authority in this location. This city is also destroyed violently, and we think it's another Egyptian, because they left their calling card. And this is probably, uh, we have the text of Rehoboam in his fifth year, Shishak coming and destroying Jerusalem, well, to get to Jerusalem, you have to go through Gezer. And so we think that this was one of the cities he would have had to have come through. This city is destroyed and on top of it. The administrative quarter changes. We have a domestic quarter with small domestic houses. The pottery is typical of the ninth century. And then we have a brand new city after this is destroyed where we go back to an administrative city. And now the pottery, it looks very... Uh, Judean with imports. And so, just as a quick summary, uh, we can see at Gezer that we have this shift because it sits on the border. Sometimes it's a Canaanite city, sometimes it has uh, Philistine influence, sometimes it becomes uh, Judean. It goes back to a, a local patronage, and then it comes back Judean in the 8th century. And we have the uh, ceramic evidence that's uh, matching up to this. Now just um, adding the biblical text to this, reading between the lines, the question is, can these recent developments in the archeology span of the Shre law be coalesced with the information about the United Monarchy? I will highlight just three examples, and I'll do this quickly because I saw Charles give me the high sign. Then. Naturally, the first is a familiar account of David and Goliath. This battle between the Israelites and Philistines occurred at the cultural border between the Judean foothills and the Philistine coastal plain in the valley of Elah between Israel and the hill country and Philistia down on the coast. This event is during the infancy of the kingship of Saul. The capital of this new polity was north of Jerusalem at Ramah on the central Benjamin Plateau. 
Saul and his army were far away from the center at Ramah. In 2 Samuel, we have a shift from Saul to David. There was an account of the battle of Baal Perazim between David and the Philistines. The Philistines, upon he hearing of the unification of the two polities, the house of Saul and the house of David, and the establishment of the capital of Jerusalem, marched up to the hill country and camped in the valley of Rephaim. The text mentions that David went down to the stronghold and fought the Philistines at Baal Perazim. David chases the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. Perhaps it is after this battle that the fortified city of Kayaf is established, near the earlier battle of David and Goliath. The next chapter, we have Solomon's reign, who was more focused on diplomatic relations versus the battles at, like his father. An infamous account notes that Solomon fortified Hatsor, Megiddo, and Gezer, possibly as a fortified city or a guard up to Jerusalem. And I mentioned the added description that Gezer was given to as a dowry. Just in a quick summary, we can see that Saul avoids the northern Shrey Law, this Canada enclave, and first encounters the Philistines in the Elah Valley. The next stage of the hill country polity is under David. The first stage is to move his capital from Hebron to the center of the tribes in a city that did not belong to any tribe, and naturally this was Jerusalem. Once this polity, perhaps a, a baby state, or to use a more anthropological term, emergent state, primitive state, or secondary state, once this little state is under David's control at Jerusalem, the Philistines come up and attack at Baal Perazim in the valley of Rephaim. David repels the Philistines out of the hill country. This young state pushes the border to Kerbe Kayafa, a previously unknown fortress in administrative center of Judah. And we also have the excavations at Bet Shemesh that show in the 10th century the city changed from a Canaanite city to an Israelite city. Now the border of this new kingdom has two new posts situated in the foothills. By the time we get to the second generation of this growing state, we have a political alliance between the 20th dynasty and Solomon with the capture of Gezer. Recent, ex recent research, especially the site of Kerbe Kayafa, have, has revolutionized our thinking of the development of the state. It is ironic how one unknown site can change the chessboard of history. Ironically, cultural memory embedded in the biblical accounts of the United Monarchy preserved what we are seeing on the ground. Thank you. I think each of these folks could do with like an hour apiece. That's a, a lot of material packed in there. Thank you so much, Steve. And these folks will be around for you to do some questioning of them as well. Next, we've got getting mic'd up and getting up there, Chris McKinney, going for gold, bringing home bronze. Jerusalem's role in the Arab copper industry and the biblical account of Solomon. If anybody did not get one of the sheets that kind of lays this out, Charles has got them and he'll pass them on while Chris gets his PowerPoint up and ready to go. And uh, fasten your seatbelts, gang. Uh, after this, we'll have a break. Test. Okay. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank you all for being here and thank Mark and uh, Jim and especially Steve for throwing my name out there. It's uh, an honor to be among, these, uh, be among these scholars and present some, some of my research. Uh, the year is 714 BC. Sargon II, king of Assyria, has just led a daring attack against the kingdom of Musasir in Uartu, that is biblical Ararat. And his officers are busy cataloging the immense plunder from the looting of the great temple and its royal storehouses. While this is going on, an artist, court artist, is recording the events for permanent display at Sargon's great palace in Dor Shurukin. In the 1840s and the 1850s, Paul Emil Boda discovered this bas relief that you see, and many others in Sargon's short lived capital in Dor Shurukin. Unfortunately, this relief would not survive for long, as it and a number of other accompanying priceless artifacts were being transported to Europe 
when a Bedouin raid caused the ship to sink at the to the bottom of the Tigris River in 1853. Nevertheless, Flandin's drawings of Boda's discoveries did survive, which allow scholars to examine the content of these reliefs, despite many of them being lost. Accordingly, some scholars began to point to the similarities between this very famous relief, along with its accompanying text to the golden shields of Solomon, which were hung, as the Bible says, in the house of the cedars of Lebanon, which is one of the five main parts of Solomon's palace as described in 1 Kings 6 and 7. This building, which was located, uh, at least we think, beneath the Herodian Temple Mount, was presumably the storehouse and armory of Jerusalem, and is therefore a suitable piece of evidence for us to briefly examine in order to understand the Bible's portrayal of Solomon's grand wealth. The sources of Solomon's golden wealth, as described in the Bible, are immense, but they can be boiled down to three main categories. A shipment of talents, a, gold, uh, a shipment of talents of gold from Ophir and a naval expedition, along with Hiram, king of Tyre, from a lot, a gift of 120 talents of gold from the queen of Sheba, and accumulated wealth from trade, merchants, and vassals, termed the kings of the West, culminating in the number 666 talents of gold in one year. Just as an aside to this, we do not know where Ophir was exactly located. Some suggest India, Somalia, and everywhere in between. But we do have some archaeological evidence for this in Israel, at Tel Kisile, as noted by this ostraca, which mentions Ophir and gold from Tel Kisile. Now, going back to the house of the forest of Lebanon, one can clearly understand many aspects of the building plan of the structure as portrayed here on this reconstruction. When compared to the temple of Musasir uh, in the Sargon relief, which in my opinion may actually have been the armory of the city, the parallels with the house of the forest of Lebanon are particularly striking. As similar architectural features, such as three-tiered windows or perhaps shelves, along with rectangular frames and four rows of pillars match closely with the biblical description. In any event, as pointed out by Millard, the different sized golden shields on the Temple of Musasir are a clear parallel with the Solomonic golden shields that adorn the house of the forest of Lebanon in Jerusalem. These golden shields were not meant to be used for battle, but instead were a decorative prestige item that publicized the strength of Yahweh and his Davidic heir in the same way that the shields publicized the strength of Musasir's chief god Haldia and his king Ritsana on the Sargon relief. In this regard, Sargon's attack on Musasir represents a historical parallel with that of Shishak against Rehoboam, which would be Solomon's heir. This brings us to an important point in the way that the biblical authors and other ancient Near Eastern texts deal with prestige items that were accumulated and or looted by their heroic monarchs. Simply put, gold is at the top of the hierarchy of precious metals, whereas copper or bronze was considered to be a lesser item. This reality can be seen in the portrayal of Solomon's golden age versus Rehoboam's bronze age, as can be seen on these texts. Though the symbol of the different metals are through the symbols of the different metals that were used to construct the shields. My goal in this paper is not to argue for the historicity or the plausibility of the accumulation of Solomon's gold as described in Kings. Instead, I would like to illustrate the ever-growing evidence for 10th century BC copper production and trade in the southern, in the southern Levant. But before we do that, I would like to compare some of Sargon's plundered items from this text in, in relief from Musasir to the account of Solomon's building projects in Jerusalem. First of all, ignore the poor idol or noble that is being dismembered by the Neo-Assyrian soldiers over here on the bottom left. Uh, they're well known for their brutality. Uh, in this description, uh, we read that a very large quantity of 3,600 talents of rough copper uh, were brought in in this, uh, in this looting. This is fairly paltry when compared to other numbers of, uh, or I should say gold and silver are fairly, uh, fairly less when compared to this high number of copper. And it also parallels closely with the description of Solomon's wealth which is counted down to the talent in the case of gold, whereas the weight of the bronze was not ascertained due to its great quantity. 
So even though Solomon's era was golden in the biblical portrayal, it also appears that there was a very high quantity of copper flowing to Jerusalem. But copper was not considered to be the predominant symbol of prestige or power. Instead, as we have seen with Rehoboam, it is often used to represent Yahweh's disfavor and the failure of a given monarch over against the accumulation of gold. Consider the following statistics. Gold is mentioned more than twice as many times as bronze or copper, despite the fact that bronze was a much more prevalent metal in all society. By the way, gold and, or I should say bronze and copper are not always differentiated in the text. Of all the references to gold in the Book of Kings, almost 60% of them occur in relation to Solomon's reign. Almost all of the other references to gold uh, in Kings relate to Yahweh's temple and the Davidic palace in Jerusalem concerning either plunder lost in the form of tribute or bribe or the dedication of new treasures to the temple or, or, or palace. It is a very st different statistical picture when we come to silver, likely due to its use as a type of currency or proto-currency in ancient Israel. In the case of copper or bronze, despite it being mentioned far fewer times than gold, a similar st a statistical picture occurs in Kings. Almost half of the references are related to Solomon, while 95% of all references to bronze or copper are related to the temple or palace. On the other hand, it is interesting to observe the way these occurrences of gold and bronze appear in kings. In my view, gold and bronze represent an important literary device for the writer of kings. Besides from what we have seen with Solomon and Rehoboam, virtually every Judahite monarch has some detail in their royal biography that is connected with the pursuit of gold via Ophir, or the dedication of golden objects to Yahweh's temple, or the loss of golden objects through Jerusalem being plundered. In connection with bronze, it is largely absent throughout the book and is used as bookends to the Solomonic era in which he constructed two bronze pillars, Yachin and Boaz, in front of the temple, only to have these two plundered along with the rest of Jerusalem's treasures during the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. In this vein, bronze functions as the last vestige of the Solomonic era. Gold came and went depending on the faithfulness and prowess of Judah's monarchs but Solomon's bronze foundations lasted until even those were removed. In short, we can observe the writer of Kings uses gold as a major literary theme throughout the book. This does not mean that these references are not historical, but simply that they were prioritized over other economic realities in order to portray wealth and prestige, something present really in all ancient Near Eastern uh, cultures. However, if we are to better understand the economy of the 10th century BCE, in which Solomon is described as to having dominion over all the kings of the West, we must turn to copper, which even in the Iron Age was most likely, seems to be, the most important metal for everyday life. In this section, we will focus our attention on the archaeology and historical geography of the Arava, the region just south of the Dead Sea, during the Iron 2A, that would be the 10th and the 9th centuries BC. Throughout this section, we will be tracking our discussion geographically in the map that you see on the far right, uh, marked with a gold star depending on where we are. We begin with two regions in the kingdom of Judah proper, the Shvela and the Beersheba Basin. Recently, an enormous amount of new excavations have occurred and are ongoing in the Shvela, as Steve pointed out some of them. The emerging archeological picture from the Shvela and the Iron 2A is pretty clear. Many new sites were built and fortified. Most of the old Bronze Age or iron settlements were settled again, with many of them being uh, uh, fortified as well. In the Negev, although most of the excavations took place in the 60s and 70s, it is also clear that the Iron 2A was a period of major expansion and growth in sites throughout this region. Thus, the Iron 2A represents the beginning of a growth trend in the Shvela and Beersheba Basin, which I believe derives from the southern hill country and the United Kingdom or the Kingdom of Judah a little bit later on. That ultimately is going to culminate in the 8th century and, of course, the Assyrian attacks at the end of that period. In my dissertation, um, I, I dealt with this issue of the city list in Joshua 15 and Joshua 18, and I believe it dates to around this time period, the reflection of this dates to around this time period, in which we can see the number of sites uh, being relatively one-to-one -one in terms of what we have in Iron 2A sites in the Negev and the Shrela and in the Central Hill Country. This takes us to another region, the Negev Highlands. 
Uh, the Negev Highland Iron Age sites represent about 60 fortresses that were excavated by Meshul and Cohen in the 1970s. These fortresses are situated between the Beersheba Basin and Maktesh Ramon, or more or less within the southernmost parts of the allotment of Judah and Canaan as described in the Bible. These sites seem to all date to the same time period, which is variously dated to the, 11th and, uh, the late 11th and 10th centuries BC, although it's important that some radiometric dates seem to place some activity there continuing into the 9th century. The purpose of these fortresses continues to be debated, but most consider uh, them to be connected with the Arava copper production and trade that connected the Arava with the coastal routes. It also seems likely that these sites were targeted by Shishak in his campaign to the region as a result of the many uh, sites that are mentioned in his uh, relief. This brings us to a very well-known text, 1 Kings 9, 17 through 18, uh, which uh, Steve at least read the first part of. Following the famous description of the buildings of Megiddo, Hazor, and Gezer, and Beit Horon, we read that Solomon built Baalat and Tamar. Gezer and Beit Horon, as we have seen, obviously represent uh, a route connecting the Ayalon Valley and the coastal, the coastal plain with uh, Jerusalem. But Kohavi, the initial excavator of a site called Tel Mochata, argued for a similar reconstruction with Baalat and Tamar. With Tamar being typically identified with Enhatseva, Kohavi identified Baalat with the site of Tel Mohata and suggested that 1 Kings uh, 9.18 represented a similar line of fortification connecting the Beersheba Basin with the northern Arava, probably around what's called the Ascent of Scorpion, which is a, you know, a very fun name for a road. Uh, the excavators of Tel Mohata recently produced the final report of this site which indicated that Mohata was one of the largest sites in the Beersheba Basin and had Iron 2A remains that ended in a fiery destruction. Now these remains were dated to the late Iron 2A, that would be the 9th century, uh, with a corresponding destruction that could theoretically be associated with Aramean activity. On the other hand, given the fact that many of the forms in the 9th century also occur in the 10th century, and this layer was not reached in a very wide area, it seems very possible or even plausible to me that the site was built in the 10th century and could in fact be, as Kohavi argued, the Baalat mentioned in 1 Kings 9.18. Uh, here's just a look at the stratigraphy of the site. On the other hand, uh, if we take a look at the identification of Tamar, we have a very widely agreed upon identification due in large part to the occurrence of the name on two classical maps. The Pudinger map, which you see here, presumably representing second century AD realities, and the Medaba map, uh, which you have here, graphically illustrating the Holy Land in the sixth century AD. In both maps, Tamar is shown just to the south of the Dead Sea, which accords well with Enhatseva. The archaeology of Enhatseva is problematic, as the site was excavated uh, by the IAA, by Cohen and Israel, uh, but was never fully excavated, or I should say never fully published. Renewed excavations at the site, now led by Tali Erickson Guinea, will hopefully shed more light on the very important stratigraphy of this Iron Age fortress. According to uh, Erickson Guinea, who very nicely shared some of her current views of the site with me, Enhatseva had an 11th century uh, pre-fortress settlement that included industrial evidence connected with copper activity. The first fortress stratum, stratum 8, is a small fortress that the excavators, and as well as Erickson Guinea, dated to the 10th century BC. Following this phase in the 9th century and continuing into the 8th century, a massive 100 meter by 100 meter square casemate fortress was constructed, including a very well uh, built four chambered gate. Significantly, the 10th to the 8th century BCE remains at uh, Enatseva closely match the realities as described in the biblical text with regards to the Edomite relations with Jerusalem's monarchs, which have a very complex uh, and very, really, quite frankly, detailed uh, amount of information regarding this period. Now, time does not allow for us to go into all of these uh, details, but we can summarize it as follows. Edom was a vassal to David and Solomon throughout much of the 10th century. Solomon exploited that, it appears, according to the Bible, by taking over the Negev and Arava trade routes. Shishak's campaign, probably around the year 925, seems to have been directed at either destroying or taking over the copper industry. 
After a gap of about a half century, the Edomites became a vassal of Judah in the ninth century in the reign of Jehoshaphat. But after several back and forth between the Judahite monarchs and Edomites, it seems that the Edomites became independent only to be, uh, become um, taken over once more by Uzziah in the mid-eighth century for finally uh, wrenching away their freedom in around the year 733. That's the picture we get from the Bible. Now, the biblical background is important because it allows us to compare that to what we now see in the copper industry that has been discovered at places like Phanon and Timna. Now, when we turn to these, the Phanon region of Jordan is directly across the Arava in, 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 and in Hatseva, about 22 kilometers away. And the presence of copper there has been known for millennia. In the early 2000s, Levi and Nahar carried out wide-scale excavations in the region and focused much of their attention on Kirbet et Nahas. At Nahas, they covered, uncovered a well-built 10th century square fortress with a four-chambered gate. This fortress was obviously intended to protect the copper mining and smelting operations that took place in its vicinity. Significantly, the gate of the fortress was later closed in the 9th century, which perhaps shows the relationships between Judah and Edom, which were varied, as we've seen, at that time. In the case of Timnah, Ben Yosef's excavations beginning there in 2012 and continuing have totally revolutionized our understanding of the copper industry in the southern Arava. Rothenberg had previously dated all the copper activity in this region to the 13th and the 12th centuries. As Ben Yosef's excavations have made clear, uh, this can no longer be sustained. As his excavations at Slaves Hill in particular uh, have shown that there is a peak of activity in the late 11th, but especially the 10th and into the 9th century. Now, there is no smoking gun to indicate uh, who is in charge of this type of copper production. Certainly, they are Edomites that are here. But archaeobotanical archeo remains, as well as some pottery, do show tangible connections with the coastal plain and the Shvela. The relationship of Edom and Jerusalem, as described in Samuel and Kings, as well as Shishak's campaign to the Negev, indicate, in my opinion, a political struggle for the control of copper sources and trade during the 10th and the 9th century. In light of these uh, recent discoveries related to the copper industry during the era of very prominent kings who were ruling over Jerusalem, it seems worthwhile to examine some of the past discussion associated with uh, the site of Etzion Geber. Etzion Geber is mentioned in connection with the wilderness wanderings in the Book of Numbers and as well as in Deuteronomy and in the gold activities of uh, Jerusalem's monarch. It is never explicitly connected with a seaport, but it is explicitly connected with shipbuilding. In light of these passages, three suggestions have been offered based on the assumption that Etzion Geber must be located on the shoreline of the Gulf of Aqaba. Excavating in the 1930s and the 1940s, Nelson Glick suggested that Etzion Geber and Elat were identical and based uh, on his excavations at Tel Khalife, identified them at that site. Rothenberg in the 1960s suggested Jezerat Faran or Pharaoh's Island, which you see depicted there, based upon uncovering some negabite sherds and some Midianite sherds or Kariaware, as perhaps as well an Iron Age harbor. Edward Robinson, much earlier in 1838, visited the northern shore of the Gulf of Aqaba and suggest, suggested that Etzion was preserved in Ain el Gajan, uh, which is located th 38 kilometers to the north of the Red Sea. In his understanding, the Arabic toponym preserved the name, but he believed that the Red Sea had uh, retreated from that point. Uh, this is not the case. It certainly didn't re uh, retreat 38 kilometers. On the other hand, I don't think it's exactly clear that Etzion Geber must be considered to be a port site. As I mentioned, Etzion Geber is typically related to a lot, but there is no ancient text that demands that the site be connected with a port. Instead, the references indicate that it is a site associated with shipbuilding. In both the Solomon and Jehoshaphat passages, we find references to the construction of Phoenician vessels. As Robinson pointed out, Jezeret Faran is a very small island and not exactly the best place for constructing ships. For construction of ship, or perhaps putting ships back together, it necessitated a great deal of organic material, such as rope, 
wood, uh, uh, as well as other organic materials. In my opinion, then, Jezerat Faran, which may have well been an Iron Age harbor, uh, is not a very suitable site for Etzion Geber. Instead, one should look back to Robinson's original suggestion at Ein Gajan, modern Ein Yodfata, located along modern Highway 90. From a toponymic perspective, uh, the connection between uh, this site and Etzion is quite suitable. But more than that, I noticed on Musul's map the name Bir Jabir, just to the southeast. Jabir clearly could preserve the name Geber, as, this, as the consonants are identical. Even more significantly, these springs, along with the most copious spring in the area, Ein Taba, represent a very large mud flat that spans the entire width of the Arava in the area. His visit to the site, now 110 years ago, uh, was very insightful as he visited it both in September, that would be the hot part, as well as in the wet part in April, and it produced much of the same conditions. He even comments on the taste of the water being sulfury uh, and the fact that it was cool even on a, a hot day where it was 110 uh, degrees. Uh, we also don't know much about uh, the Jordanian side of this, uh, Jordanian side of this area, whereas the Israeli side is well known, the Jordanian side is not. So it could be that there's a number of archaeological sites that we just simply do not know about. Now, the Taba Oasis was obviously the main source of fuel for the copper smelting at Timna. However, it could also have been the location of Solomon and Jehoshaphat's shipbuilding activities. If so, one can see the continuation of this geographical line, as we have talked about earlier. It's also worth noting uh, that there's the possibility that the site is mentioned in Shishak's uh, campaign as a site, very, uh, as a name is mentioned, that's quite similar to it. To conclude, uh, there is no direct or indirect evidence of the accumulation of gold by Solomon, although there are ancient Near Eastern parallels to this practice. However, the accumulation and accounting of gold in Yahweh's temple by the Davidic dynasty was a major, major theological theme in the Book of Kings that can be traced throughout the book. This theme can be described as Davidic heirs attempting to attain, but never quite reaching, the golden age of Solomon. The sources of gold in Solomon's reign are varied, but the uh, shipbuilding site of Etzion Geber, perhaps, and possibly the port of Eilat on the Red Sea, can be connected with specific geographic realities, perhaps connected to copper activity, even if we cannot find the traces of gold at this time. An additional consideration is understanding the development of ancient sites from the 10th to the 8th century. In general, the 10th century BC sites are, are less impressive than what we find in the 9th, the 9th and the 8th century. Nevertheless, we do see the start of something new in the 8th century, which I believe can probably be connected with the United Monarchy. Now finally, the accumulation of copper, uh, without counting, the Bible says, by Solomon is also present in Kings, but is relegated to a third class item despite its dominant role in the economy of the 10th and 9th century BC. The sources of copper in Jerusalem's presumable control over them can be linked to archaeological sites that can be plausibly connected with the biblical toponyms and geopolitical realities associated with Solomon's reign. These include the following. They have highland fortresses, possibly Tel Malhata, maybe Baalat, uh, Enat Seva, Kirbet and Nahas, Timna, and possibly the oasis at Ein Taba, as I've suggested which, even regardless of that, was the main uh, source for copper smelting in terms of fuel at Timna. In sum, it is possible to see a geographical and archaeological background to the treasure texts of Solomon and later monarchs in the current archaeological picture of the Iron Age of southern Israel. We, we have uh, amongst us all of these speakers are in a very difficult position, and, and I'll tell you why. We've got some amazing scholars amongst us that, that do this for a living in different ways, in different phases, in different touches. And then we've got a lot of people that are just interested students in general. And so as a result, the, the speakers are in a very difficult position of trying to say things to the scholars and also trying to say things to folks who are not scholastically uh, engulfed in this field of study. And, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a real challenge. And, and so a lot of this, you sort of feel like you're drinking water from a fire hydrant. It's just gushing out and you're trying to figure out and trying to keep up. It would be easier if each of the scholars had an hour and a half 
but they don't, or we would not get through today and, and uh, in time for Steve Ortiz to eat again, which he's made it very abundantly clear he's go, good for about an hour. Um, so sit down, fasten your seatbelt. Our next speaker is Tim Harrison. Tim's been a friend of mine for a long, long time, a friend of our library. He's just an outstanding person as well as a marvelous scholar and archaeologist who digs north of Israel but has some really fascinating things to say. I've been dying to hear this. So fasten your seatbelt and join me in welcoming our Canadian speaker, Tim Harrison. Very much, Mark. It's very good to be here. And uh, I was trying to think back to the first time I came. It's been a few years now, and it's really good to be back. And uh, I am going to take a com comment of a few minutes ago to suggest that I'm going to use more than 20 minutes, but I'll try not to, uh, because of the fact that there is so much to talk about. I'm something of an interloper to this seminar because I've been asked to talk about the northern perspective, and it's a very rich body of material, both archaeologically and textually, and to try and squeeze it into 20 minutes is actually impossible. And so, but I'm going to try and do my best, and in fact, if I'm able to get uh, through the main part of what I want to focus on, I also want to try and see if I can squeeze in a little bit on the later part of the Iron Age. But I'm going to focus mainly on the early part of the Iron Age sequence for the north, and uh, I want to try and really emphasize a couple of key themes. One is that while the local cultures in this northern context are very unique in their own ways and have very different cultural expressions to what you would experience or what you've been seeing in some of the other talks in the, after, in, the, in the south, they nevertheless share many dynamics, larger structural dynamics, social, economic, political. And so comparing between north and south, I think, is actually a, a very uh, hopefully profitable and productive kind of uh, thing to do. So because it is impossible to try and, and describe the whole, um, even summarize the whole uh, picture, I'm going to focus really on two sites, but I also want to try and give a few slides, maps, that give you a sense of the kind of before and after. So here is a slide that shows you a map of the projected ex extent of the Hittite Empire, more or less towards the latter days of the Bronze Age, at the end of the Bronze Age, when it had more or less reached its greatest extent. We have roughly around 1200, early 12th century. We have the Sea Peoples uh, events that I think most of you have uh, some familiarity to. And this has impacted certainly the understanding of what was happening uh, in the south. But there's also an awful lot to say about what was happening in the north. We know about the Sea Peoples scenes on the mortuary temple of Ramses III in Medina Tavu. When we get down into the 11th century, early 11th century, we have a, something of an after what has happened in this settlement process and in this transformation from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, the collapse of the Bronze Age uh, states that I just alluded to, like the Hittites, with this, uh, I think, a very interesting story, the tale of Wenamun, that describes a kind of a, a social and political landscape of the Eastern Mediterranean in this early 11th century. That's very, very different from what had been in place back a century before. So focusing on the northern context, our basic hypotheses that we've been working from is that in the aftermath of the collapse of the Hittite Empire, and there's a lot of discussion about what caused that collapse that range from environmental through to political and um, conflicts and migrations and so forth, in that aftermath, what we're starting to see through our research and focus on the archaeology and, and, and also a growing body of epigraphic and textual evidence is the emergence of a series of tiny kingdoms. I call them kinglets or diminutive states, we don't really quite know how to describe them, but in many ways they parallel structurally the kinds of kingdoms that we know about much more thoroughly in the south, like Israel and the Transjordanian kingdoms, the Phoenicians and so forth. So what I'm going to do here is focus very, very quickly on two of these kingdoms. Here's a map that shows you by the time we get down into the 10th and 9th century, the period that we're more or less trying to focus on in this seminar this afternoon, and we have a very well-developed political and social landscape. Lots of little kingdoms, they're fighting constantly with each other. It's a very volatile political landscape, but it's also one that generates spectacular sculptural and artistic expression. It's out of this sort of 
social and political ferment, that we have many new ideas, new technologies, dealing with writing systems, with um, ways of uh, doing trade and business through commerce and, and, and long distance trade. I don't have time to discuss any of that here this afternoon, but I just want to give you a taste of some of the kinds of quite spectacular things that these kingdoms produce. And here's the second key, uh, um, broader structural thing to take away from this, is that while they're small and have very weak political structures and culture, in the center of each of these kingdoms, there is always a large regal royal city that is almost overstating in its effort to try and project its power through the expression of sculptures, monumentality, of buildings, and so forth. It's almost as though it's proportional, uh, the opposite, the, the, the level of weakness that they probably actually had politically is um, offset by their efforts to build this and project this picture of monumentality and power. So the first of these is Carchemish. It's a very famous one. It was actually the, the seat of the Viceroy um, during the Hittite period when uh, the empire, the Hittite empire had reached its greatest extent. And brilliant work that's been done by a historian in the UK, David Hawkins, already back in the 1980s had begun piecing together something of a dynastic succession of kings, we think maybe almost continuous, it's a bit of a debated point, it's a very complex discussion, but nevertheless some evidence of political continuity that spans the collapse of the Hittite Empire in the late 12th century, or early 12th century, and the, um, what emerges as the kingdom of, of Hatti um, at Carchemish, we, we know more det in detail in the 10th and 9th centuries. So in that so-called Dark Age we often refer to of the early Iron Age, we actually have in this specific example evidence of some kind of political continuity, which includes kings in which there, ha there are monumental inscriptions in which they are projecting um, some kind of political dynasty. So here's a map of Carchemish, and Carchemish is a legendary site for its archaeological history. I, I, it's a remarkable place to go. Um, I don't have time to really discuss some of the richness of the archaeological site, but just here's a very recent photograph. That, um, I've been there in the last few years. An Italian team has been working, and we've been collaborating closely. And you can see, actually, in the background, for modern those of you interested in the modern situation, that's the town of Gerablis, which up until 2015 was a base of ISIS, only a few hundred yards away, and actually sits on the lower town of the archaeological site itself. And in the foreground there, you see the Italian excavations of one of the large Syro-Hittite or Neo-Hittite palaces. In the earlier excavations by the British back in the 19, early 19th century and 1900s, um, they also found evidence of this monumentality in the form of these mon large uh, staircase and large temples and palaces, but also, very interestingly, hints of some sculptural um, evidence that I want to come back to uh, shortly. We think that there were lions that were flanking the gate in this monumental staircase that led up to the citadel and to the palaces and, and temples on the summit of the mound. Here are some of the sculptures that have been coming up now just in the last two or three years in the ongoing t uh, Italian excavations that give you a taste of some of the um, really amazing uh, monuments that were being constructed by the uh, rulers on this royal center of the kingdom of Hatti. This is another piece of very interesting, they were able to piece together from the old excavations pieces that they found actually literally sitting in the, out in the backyard of the British excavation house. They re-excavated and founded pieces of these things and were able to put together part of the statue of Kubaba, who we know from Anatolian religion to have been the mother, identified as the mother of the gods. I want to come back to that point a little bit later. There is much, much more to show, but I don't have time uh, to give you more detail. I want to move now to the second example, and that's the site of Teltainat, which is the project that I've been working on for the past 20-some years. And this site uh, was excavated in the 1930s by the University of Chicago, and as archaeologists often unfortunately do, while they excavated it quite well, they never really published the results of their excavations. And so as it happens, after uh, World War II came and went, no one returned to the excavations, and most of what they had discovered was forgotten. 
that's something that I'm not too regretful for because it has given us an opportunity. In any case, the other part of the story that gets very interesting is that in the early 2000s, excavations on the Aleppo Citadel began uncovering a large temple, the temple to the storm god, uh, and, and we know about this place in ancient sources. But what really got a lot of people's attentions in about 2005, 2006, they uncovered in the side uh, part of the temple this sculpture that shows the storm god on the left, and then facing him is a human, a mortal, who we are told in an accompanying inscription that's a little bit hard to see, but it's sort of like cartoon quote, like coming out of his mouth and then ov up over his hat, and then down those registers behind him is a lengthy inscription in which he begins by d identifying who he is. I am King Teta, the hero, the ruler of the land of Palestine. So he's both claiming to have full royal kingly status, which is something that is new in this early Iron Age context, but also he's identifying himself as a ruler of a place that didn't, we didn't know existed at that point. And this has triggered a flurry of archaeological um, debate and um, discussion in amongst historians trying to sort this out. As it happens, there were, have been inscriptions that have been found before, including this one here, and this is what we call hieroglyphic Luvian. It's not related to the hieroglyphic language of Egypt, so um, unfortunately I couldn't benefit from the <laughs> stuff that I'd learned uh, with Jim Hofmeyer many, many years ago, but uh, it's an Anatolian uh, ling linguistic tradition, but part of one of the inscriptions that had been excavated by the University of Chicago back in the 30s includes a reference to a slightly different spelling, but a similar reference to this place. And what has happened since the discovery of the Aleppo inscription, others have found similar uh, kinds of monuments, more or less in this area of the circle that I'm marking here, including sites down near Hama in the south, and then most recently um, two examples from a site on the coast at a place called Arsus. And then in our own excavations, we have found yet a, a, another example of a, a reference to this place. So it's given us increasing confidence that we think we've begun to identify the place of a, or the existence of another one of these tiny little kingdoms, which in this early Iron Age, Luvian co cultural context was being identified as the land or the kingdom of P Palestine. Or so uh, the question has been, where is the capital? And uh, the, assu the, the assumption has been that it is at Tainot. And the um, epigrapher, David Hawkins, who I mentioned earlier, who was in instrumental in making the identification, he proposed that this is related to the Palisset of the Sea People's fame back to the Medina Tabu Temple reliefs and inscriptions that I mentioned earlier. And just to give you the, the idea, um, this is one of them being apparently or supposedly being depicted on that relief. So to tie not then very specifically, um, in the few minutes I have left, I'll just summarize some of the results of our own ongoing excavations. We began there in, in uh, the late 90s, began excavation in about 2004 through 2005, and we've been working there pretty much continuously ever since. You can see here the site. It happens to be right on the fence, on the border with Syria. You can see the border basically marked by the Orontes River in the background. So similar to Carchemish, this has made life particularly interesting and uh, tragic, actually, um, over the past six to seven years. Made it very, very difficult to work in this area. It's also made it, I think, even more important that we are working there, but that's another story that we can talk about another day. So very quickly, a few slides. Here is a picture of the very large-scale excavations by the University of Chicago back in the 1930s. As I mentioned, uh, they excavated, but essentially uh, left the site made on the eve of World War II, never came back, and uh, really never really published their work. Our excavations began, as I said, in the early 2000s, and here's a quick sh uh, sh slide just showing some of the topographic and other kinds of uh, surface work that we began first doing. Our basic stratigraphic strategy, uh, excavation strategy, was to try and reconnect with the old excavations. And you can actually see the main excavation areas on this image. They're the dark shadowed areas. And so we started targeting areas next to them to try and re-engage with the earlier material to resolve lots of outstanding questions that remained from the earlier work. What that 
has led to was uh, quite unexpected. Uh, we thought we would be working in later Iron Age levels initially, but we went very quickly into early Iron Age material, contemporary to the context that we're interested here. And that produced a wealth of material. I, I won't have time to describe it, but here is evidence of textile production, a whole spectrum of very interesting objects that um, fit comfortably into this early Iron Age context. But perhaps most dramatically, and what got most international interest and attention from the scholarly community was the wealth of so-called Mycenae 3C, or late Helladic 3C pottery, of which you see a quick slide of some of them here, as well as these slides, or shirts here, that give you some of the more diagnostic kinds of decorative treatments that that distinctive pottery tradition is known for. We also found in another area part of a very, a very interesting a workshop, an iron uh, metal workshop, but in this case, they're in both working copper, bronze, but also iron. They're experimenting. It's, a, it's clearly an experimenting sort of transitional phase in that sort of new technology. It's not new technology as such, but they're clearly beginning to work more extensively in iron, and that, that has been very interesting. It was also a very, very wealthy community. We have found a wealth of jewelry and other fine art, illustrated here with a few pieces. And in some, this early Iron Age settlement was actually a very wealthy, it was large by our estimates, at least 20 hectares by the end of the 12th century or early 11th century, so a large city and we found evidence of multilingual. Uh, we have epigraphic material from um, different linguistic traditions. It's clearly a very diverse and affluent community in this early Iron Age context. Sealing those remains is a series of large, large monumental buildings of which you see the foundations of one of these buildings known by the Chicago team as Building 14. Its length north to south is over 100 meters, about 50 meters east-west, at least. Now, there's a lot of questions about this building. We're still not quite sure what to make of it, but essentially we can stratigraphically position it very comfortably into this 10th century time frame that we're interested in here. And it has been already, by a number of scholars, immediately identified as the prospective house or palace of Teta. I'm not ready to go that far yet, but it certainly could have been. It's contemporary with the 11th, early 10th century context. So something is dramatically happening here from a large town, a wealthy town, a town that shows lots of evidences of connections between east and west, north and south, but one that's now being transformed into what essentially I would describe as a citadel with a series of large buildings. Most of the residential area that we had seen in the preceding period is now gone. And likely, that population is being displaced into the so-called lower town surrounding the site, an area that we haven't yet been able to investigate excavation-wise, but which has produced through surface collections a wealth of interesting material, both domestic residential types of archaeological evidence, as well as industrial, lots of evidence of production, of pottery, of metalworking, of ivory working, and so forth. Something that we really, really are keenly interested in exploring in the years to come. The other thing we've been trying to do is to see if we can rehabilitate some of the objects, including the epigraphic material, those hieroglyphic Luvian inscriptions, and that, that's, that's what this slide is doing. We're trying to plot these pieces from the Chicago excavations to see where they were concentrated based on the fragments associated with what we think to be coherent monuments. And we found that they really clustered, in particular, in this area. And we began then focusing in this area that's marked in, in the red circle here. The buildings that you see here are part of a series of palaces and temples from the um, mostly 9th century city, when Tainat had been uh, well known to have become the royal city of the kingdom of Patina, or Unki, which we think is a later development of the earlier Palestine. So we began excavations in about 2011, 2012 in that area, and this is where a lot of other surprises came to the front, and they began with this spectacular uh, discovery of ours in 2011 of a lion. If you want to get a sense of the scale, unfortunately it's cut off, it's below the carpet uh, there. Um, it's about um, a meter and a half, a little over a meter and a half from toenails to 
his mane and about uh, uh, similarly in, in length. So this is an enormous lion. And this is something from a strictly art historical perspective, a kind of quantum leap in sculptural and artistic expression. You will not, there is no such thing in the record of the ancient Near East or frankly um, of the world uh, that dates uh, to anything prior to this in terms of its aesthetic sophistication and quality. And so this is something that I want to really emphasize. These tiny little kingdoms were doing spectacular things. And I will say when I was a student, I was inundated with or ingrained with the notion that the Levant was a backwater and that the great centers of civilization were in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, and so forth. What I think we're beginning to find is actually that the Levant was a generator of new ideas, new artistic expression, new economy, new technologies, and it, it was what actually began to influence a lot of the neighboring Eastern Mediterranean world. And that's the story that I'm hoping we will be able to tell as we proceed. So in the last few minutes, I, I don't have time to go into each one of these pieces, but what we have found over the last few seasons is a, su is a succession of more of these large sculptures. Um, there's the lion, we found part of a massive stone, what we call statue base, that has, a, has part of a, the famous iconic motif of the master and the animals. This is probably the oldest or certainly one of the oldest motifs in, in, in civilization and in, in human history. We trace it back to the mid fourth millennium already in Mesopotamia. It's supposed to connote the, the imposition of order over the chaotic forces of nature. And this is a motif that is really central as a part of the iconography of these sculptures and of this monumental space that these kings were building of the kingdom, I should have said at the beginning, that probably had a boundary or a territory that didn't extend more than maybe 30 kilometers from the center, just to give you a sense of the size of what they were trying to rule. Here you see another one from the kingdom, from Zinjerli, it's about 100 kilometers to the north, another one of these Syro Hittite or Neo Hittite kingdoms that has produced a similar example. But here, in this case, the statue is intact, that you can see the statue base at the base there with the, the human figure holding or sort of restraining two lions. This is a motif that now works its way from, literally from Tainot to the Aegean world. That's another whole story, the transmission of a lot of this new innovative thinking and activity and technology. And we see this working its way into the Aegean world, almost certainly coming from places like Tainot. And that's reflected in these very, very interesting bronze um, horse harness and um, singlets that were found both at Tainat and at a number of sites in Greece or the Aegean world. Other sculptures that we found include the, uh, this uh, column base that has a winged bull and a sphinx. And then quite excitingly here is the up top half, again about a meter and a half in height, of a human figure. This is a king, um, he has part. We have part of his uh, autobiographic statement, his accounts of all the wonderful things he did or claims to have done, written on his back in hieroglyphic Luvian. We're pretty confident that we can place him into the early 9th century, but there are a growing number of candidates that we can place uh, as far as some of the early kings. Our history now is beginning similar to the story at Carchemish to extend back into this so-called Dark Age. We can go certainly back into the 10th century with some of these epigraphic discoveries. Some are even arguing that there are connections that we can make, historical connections that we can make back into the 12th century. The last one uh, discovery was this past year, a year ago, 2017, we found a female statue. Um, never before had something like this been found. Here you see the um, very complicated process of extracting one of these from the ground. These things weigh a lot as well as being large. Uh, in her case, though, she had been ritually defaced, which adds another very interesting cultural uh, dynamic. Again, I don't have time to develop that whole element here, but um, here you can see a number of the um, students and staff from our project this very much just this past summer. We came back just a few weeks ago. And you can see in this large sort of gymnasium size room where we've been putting together all the thousands and thousands of fragments. Uh, because what we have found is not only intact uh, monuments, but also heavily destroyed ones. 
And that's what the point I want to end with here. Uh, so this female statue, we can't quite yet tell you why and what happened, but we are, are beginning to explore who she might have been. We don't have her name yet like we do with, her, with Shupiluluma, but it's been very tempting on my part to link her to a very intriguing personality called a woman by the name of Kupi Papias, who was the wife or mother of Teta, perhaps even the same Teta of the Aleppo inscription. We can't make those connections definitively yet, but it's a, a remarkable inscription that was found about 50 years ago in a small village called Shezar near Hama, um, up the Eurontes River, in which she describes her life and who she was and the right righteous living that she lived and the long life that she had, and she talks about her children and their generations and generations of children. And at the end, it talks about the divine queen of the land. And this is a phrase that now has got everybody's interest. Who and what is, was the divine queen of the land? And I don't have time to explain to you what, who we think and how that fits into, but we have another inscription that we think actually depicts her in a relief that you see here. And then there was even a third piece that had been forgotten, a very scrubby little uh, piece of sculpture that has an epigraphic, uh, hieroglyphic living inscription on the base that also makes reference to this divine queen of the land. You probably can guess where I'm going with this. I think that that statue that we've found this past year may well be her as well. So these are all monuments that were standing at some point in an area that we've identified as a gate complex that led up into the citadel area that had been rezoned re and restructured in this early Iron Age context, the 10th, 9th centuries that we're talking about and had created this kind of sense of monumentality, power, and uh, divine representation. I think I've lost the slide there, but I'm also all out of time. So essentially what we're beginning to do is try at time not to piece this large jigsaw puzzle together with this monumental remains, but also to get a sense of what and how this had been put together by the rulers of this kingdom and what was the importance and relevance of that. And so one of the things that we're proposing is that they had a very, um, very uh, sophisticated sense of how to project this, um, this ceremonial space. They were engaging in large uh, public displays, uh, ceremonies, whether they were processions and events and so forth that um, began to instill the, um, uh, the power and authority of these rulers. To close, um, and this is probably those of you who caught my title at the end, wondering where does the phrase the kingdoms of the idols come, and this is a direct connection back to the biblical context. In Isaiah 10, verses 9 through 11, a very, very interesting text that this deals with the um, clearer connections to uh, the Assyrians and the threat of the Assyrians in the context of Judah. We have in verses 9 and 10 a very interesting uh, reference to um, these two cities, the cities of Kalnu and Carchemish. Well, Carchemish we know, um, but biblical scholars have for a long time proposed that Kalnu was the site of Kunilua. So I didn't mention the name of Tainat in antiquity. We know, and we've actually found epigraphic evidence that has confirmed that in fact ancient Tainat was Kunilua. So we have been able to connect that now to this context, to this reference in the text here, to these sort of sister settlements, the sites of Carchemish and Kalnu, which clearly, to the author of Isaiah and to the audience that this um, text was directed towards, knew these places. They were iconic, essentially, is how I would put it. And, and in many ways, they're being held up as a warning. And the warning I would like to suggest in the context of our excavations is that those places had been devastatingly destroyed, destroyed almost certainly by the Assyrians. I don't have time to go into the Assyrians, I've run out of time, but um, they're being referred to as these kingdoms of idols. And the sculptures that we're finding certainly must be a reference to that. And to the average person of the day, making those references was enough for them to know the larger cultural reality that it alluded to. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for yours. A lot of preparation and a lot of work in that. Um, can we, who's, when we do the Q&A, Tim, I'm gonna ask you about the carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, or I'll just ask you now. Is, is that 
do you understand that to mean that there was a reputation for such incredible carved things like we're seeing here? But not in Jerusalem. I mean, right. this is, and this is those of you who are working in Israel and in the, in the South, the, they're strikingly absent. Sculptural monumentality is not really a part of the material cultural record of the South. But as I've been trying to suggest with just the two sites that I use as examples here, they were, it, was, it was prevalently part of their cultural uh, identity. Okay, and were those, so the Divine Queen, would that have been an idol of sorts? <laughs> these are questions that are very hard to answer in a sentence or two, but yes, I think what we have is that we have these human figures, in the case of the kings, we know, but in the case of this woman, I think she was a very prominent member. We know in Hittite culture that the queen mothers were, they were called Tawanana, they acquired a kind of status that they held until they died, even beyond the transition of power from one ruler to the next. And so I suspect that there was a person named Kupi Papias or somebody else who acquired this kind of very prominent standing and who apparently lived for a very, very long time, probably passing through the reigns of a succession of kings. And I think she became immortalized and ultimately um, acquired a, probably a divine understanding in the community. So when I see a passage like this after listening to what you said, here's what I'm reading. Basically, the invading king is in essence saying, as I've done this with people who had these incredible, spectacular, huge, carved, beautiful idols, I'm really gonna take over Jerusalem who has diddly squat for their idols. I think it's more of a warning not to go, that it's, it's the, the, how I understand it, and I don't know that I have it right, but I, I think it's a warning, don't go down, woe to that you, path. don't, yeah, if you go down that path, you're risking the same outcome that yeah. Kunalua and Karkamesh who had. had greater idols than anything you've ever dreamed of and yet so have don't now think been you're absolutely destroyed and devastated and are, are eviscerated from the face of the earth there's no, nothing left of them they're gone amazing thank you Tim very much um, okay um, Lawson Younger friend of the library has done tons with us before David's Wars what can we know about his Aramean enemies? And it'll take him a second to get the PowerPoint going. So uh, did y'all hear the one about the archeologist and the lawyer? Uh, it was Jane and she <laughs> went first. Uh, well, I wasn't like here for stand up. Ready to go Lawson. Lawson Younger. Can you hear me in the back? I can do it anyway. Okay, there we go. All right. <laughs> I have many of my students tell me that they enjoy uh, my lectures more than once they're in another class, and they can hear me down the hall. Okay, so it's uh, really not a problem. Um, thank you, Mark, again for um, uh, putting this together, Jim Hoffmeyer, for his organizational touch, and um, it is David's Wars that I am going to talk about. I'm coming a little further south than Tim, not too much, though. Um, it has been asserted uh, that archaeology has demonstrated the necessity to dispense with the concept of an Israelite united monarchy. One scholar claims, quote, it is clear today that the biblical idea of a great united monarchy is a literary construct that represents the territorial ideology, kingship concerns, and theological ideas of late monarchic Judahite authors, end quote. So to such interpreters, the narratives about David's wars in 2 Samuel 8 and 10 are simply stories invented by late Judahite scribes. While it is clear that the historical narratives of the Hebrew Bible have gone through a Judahite editorial process, this does not mean that the United Monarchy is nothing but a literary construct. In the narratives about David's wars, there are a number of polities and toponyms mentioned. 
This paper will briefly investigate what is known about uh, the Aramean entities uh, and place names that are used in the narratives and what this might indicate. Uh, these entities are uh, listed, I gave you the list, Zoba, Zoba Beit uh, Rehov, uh, presently presented as one entity, really, I think, in the narrative. Uh, Damascus, Ma'akat, Tob, uh, Aram, Naharayim, Hamad, and Gesher. David's wars are recorded in 2 Samuel 8, uh, 1 to 14, and 10, 1 to 19, with corresponding passages in 1 Chronicles. These passages are complex with numerous text critical, compositional, and interpretive challenges. There are major differences between them. For example, 1 Samuel 8 is a type of summary inscription organized geographically, which contains no direct speech and emphasizes David mentioning his name 20 times in 14 verses. Whereas, um, uh, whereas 2 Samuel 10 utilizes direct speech and is organized along chronological concerns and only mentions David's name nine times. Consequently, these texts cannot simply be paraphrased and used uncritically to reconstruct history. Such a simplistic approach is obviously problematic, but so too is the approach that simply declares that the biblical texts are religious literary documents and therefore are utterly untrustworthy for any historical reconstruction. All texts from the ancient Near East come out of a world that was utterly religious, and literary structuring is ubiquitous to ancient narrative. Therefore, a more robust effort is essential. I have provided a handout to, I'm sorry, only the participants. I wasn't able to get enough copies to pass all around. Um, uh, in which you can see some of the complexity and rhetorical structuring. The Chronicles passages are uh, given where they are significant, where there are significant variations. A full expo exposition of these passages would be a paper unto itself. However, a few words are necessary. The structure of, the cha of chapter 8 is given here. There are two sections, each ending with the uh, verbatim statement of letter C. Yahweh gave victory to David what, wherever he went. B1 and B2 are narratives of secondary conflicts to the main um, uh, material of A1 and A2. B1 and B2 have the exact same structure. Uh, A1 narrates uh, the primary wars, uh, and while B2 narrates the plunder and uh, tribute and their dedications to Yahweh. It focuses primarily on the tribute of To'i, of Hamat, and its dedication. All the events of 2 Samuel 10 appear to have transpired in between the accounts of the defeat of Moab in 8.2 and Hadad Azer of Zobah in 8.3-4. Chapter 10 is linear chronological account comprised of three sections, a setting in the Ammonite context, the first campaign and the defeat of the Arameans, and the second campaign and their defeat. As the text pres presently stands, the imprecise temporal marker of uh, Vayihi Akhare uh, uh, Cain, sometime, sometime afterward, deliberately ties 2 Samuel 8, 1 to 14, to the immediately preceding Davidic uh, covenant uh, in chapter 7, where Yahweh's chesed towards David is on display. Yet the verbatim use of the same imprecise temporal marker in, at the beginning of chapter 10, again, Vayihi Akhare Cain, uh, ties that narration immediately back to, uh, with uh, 2 Samuel 9, where David's chesed towards Mephibosheth uh, is on display. Ironically, a chesed which will be entirely lacking in David's uh, dealings with Uriah in the following narrative. It is also important to recognize that the narratives in Samuel and Chronicles are shaped along different literary and ideological purposes. But, what exactly is the relationship between 2 Samuel 8 and 10? Some scholars believe that uh, 2 Samuel 8 is the more reliable account and that chapter 10 is dependent on it. 
Others think that it's the other way around. A third view understands the passages as narrating separate events so that there is no dependency. This option distinguishes 2 Samuel 8.3 as the description of a separate battle uh, usually thought to have occurred after those events of 2 Samuel 10. I believe that this is the best explanation and that was how I gave it in the diagram earlier. Thus, uh, there are three battles, one at Medabah, that is recorded especially in 1 Chronicles 19, another second battle at Helam, <coughs> excuse me, in 2 Samuel 10, 16, and one final uh, battle in Zobah itself. I, because of time, I'm going to have to skip this enigmatic uh, expression, uh, which um, is very problematic on a number of different levels. I have some uh, lengthy discussion about it, but uh, you'll have to uh, buy the book with the article. Okay. All right. Okay. Or you can wait for uh, Mark or somebody to ask the question. All right. Uh, the uh, present form of 2 Samuel 8 is intricately uh, linked to 2 Samuel 10. Uh, so, for example, Hadad Azer is first mentioned in uh, 2 Samuel 10, 16. This name occurs eight times in the narrative of chapter 8. And I have the verses, but I won't read them all. Okay? But it only occurs three times in chapter 10, starting in verse 16. The fact that he is not mentioned until 10, 16 means that the writer of 2 Samuel 10 account is assuming prior knowledge of 2 Samuel 8, the 2 Samuel 8 narrative, especially since Hadad Azer is not identified in verse 16 as the king of Zobah, as he is in 2 Samuel 8, 3 and 5. Even if this is the product of editing, the result is the same. There is an assumption of a knowledge of 2 Samuel 8 on the part of the readers. So now I'm going to go through some of the individual entities. 2 Samuel um, 8 is a type of summary inscription with David's victories arranged geographically along two axes. Whoops, sorry, I'm going to go back uh, no, to this. Um, and, um, and geographically, west is Philistius, and then east is Moab, north is Aram Zobah, and then south is Edom. This four-pointing, uh, the, the shaping this way, works as mirrorisms, two mirrorisms, emphasizing the completeness of David's conquest. Further, the verb naka, to strike or to smite or to um, um, uh, kill, uh, is used with uh, rhetorical value throughout the account. Again and again and again, it is opening uh, the various uh, entities. Whatever the compositional history is for these passages, they must be read very closely in order to properly understand what they are claiming before one can reconstruct a historical account. Moreover, all these problems and issues are exacerbated by the impoverished uh, state of archaeology in this part of Syria and in Lebanon. In particular, the lack of excavations done in the area where Zobah was located and the most important Aramean city of them all, Damascus. So what do we know about these entities? Well, first, uh, Zobah and Beit Rehov. Uh, the first Aramean polity mentioned is Zobah, uh, also designated Aram Zobah. In 2 Samuel uh, 8, 3, we are first introduced to Hadad Azer, son of Rehov, uh, king of Zobah. The name Hadad Azer is a Hebrew translation of the Aramaic Adad Idri. Um, the, God, the God Hadad is my help. Uh, it is a common Aramaic personal name. He is identified as the king of Zobah. Although the phrase son of Rehov could be giving the name of Hadad Azer's father, it is far more likely that this is an ethnicon, son of Rehov, that is, a Rehovite, a man from Beit uh, Rehov. Uh, this is an extremely uh, common form of West Semitic ethnic, ethnicon. This raises the question about the exact relationship of Zobah and Beit Rehov uh, to each other. The city of uh, Zobah is attested in the second millennium text from Mari. 
It is also attested in the Neo-Syrian documents of the first millennium. It may be attested in some Aramaic uh, graffiti from Hamad, 8th century. You see that at the bottom here, one example of it, where the word uh, uh, Tzadi uh, Beit He is identified by some scholars with Zobah of the Bible. However, in my opinion, the frequency of this word and the words associated with it, like the one on the other side there, uh, uh, raise doubts about this identification. In any case, the cuneiform evidence documents an important city with this name. Unfortunately, its precise location is unknown. Scholars have located uh, the town of Zobah at various different sites, including Homs, which is very high up on the map there. Uh, uh, however, a Mari, the Mari letter that I referenced locates the city south of a Tehum, which is a lake. Thus, some suggest as far south as Baal Bek in the Beka Valley. Other proposed locations like Tel uh, Gezel, um, uh, Tel Ein uh, Sharif, and Tel Ad Dar are, in my opinion, way too far south. Naaman suggests a location at present day Kutseir, uh, and I think that has good possibilities. Ultimately, only excavations, of course, can solve this. In the case of Beit Rehov, um, while some earlier scholars located it in the northern Transjordan, the consensus today places it in the southern Beka Valley. And uh, Judges 18 and 28 is really important in that regard. Uh, the question of the relationship is further complicated. First, there is confusion in the description of the entities and their contingents. In the biblical account, we see that Beit Rehov and Zobah are um, described as sending a single contingent of 20,000 foot soldiers. This is 2 Samuel 10, 6. However, in the same verse, the contingents of Maka and Tob are mentioned separately. In other words, indicating that they may be separate uh, entities. First, uh, Chronicles 19, 6, uh, parallel to 2 Samuel uh, 10, 6, mentions only the involvement of Zobah and omits uh, Beit Rehov. Uh, but it also omits any reference to Tob. Third, there are textual difficulties. The Septuagint, the Old Greek, uh, differs from the Masoretic reading. I won't go through some of this. Uh, it gets a little bit too complicated. On the handout, a few of you can see that. Thus, scholars uh, disagree about the relationship. Some have suggested that the two names refer to a single political entity. But most scholars think that Beit Rehov and uh, Zobah are two different uh, political entities that were united as one under Hadad Azer and thus have a joint army. Aram Damascus. We know nothing about Damascus during this period, really, except for 2 Samuel 8, 5 to 6, which imply that it was not politically significant at this time. Uh, there have been no archaeological excavations in Damascus that inform on this period. There have been a few things done, but nothing that informs on this period. Sorry, that's the end of that. All right. So uh, the biblical um, tradition purports that Zobah uh, had a, a certain authority over the Arameans of Tob and Maaka and over the Arameans living beyond the Euphrates, so-called Aram Naharayim. However, in case, the case of Damascus, 2 Samuel 8, 5, indicates that it had close relations with Zobah, and the um, exact relationship, of course, is not specified. It may have been an ally, it may have been a vassal, or an occupied territory. Um, it's very interesting to see how different writers opt uh, for different things, and some writers, like me, don't. <laughs> make a decision. Um, clearly, Hadad Azer, uh, king of Zopah, did not rule in Damascus. What about Maka? However, Maka is known well from Egyptian sources. The name occurs in the Egyptian literary masterpiece, Sinue, uh, where a uh, prince of Kedem is named uh, Maki. 
A uh, city of Abel first appears in the excretion text of the 19th, 18th century, along with uh, chiefs or clan leaders uh, of Ma'aku, Ma Ka'yu, sorry. Uh, later in the 15th century, uh, the city of Abil is found in a list of Thutmose III. In the Bible, uh, the name Ma'aka occurs as, as both a masculine and feminine personal name. The feminine usage raises the possibility that the entity's name derives from an ancestress. Similar in the case to a case like that of Aramean tribe of Beit Halupe. However, since the name is also used as a masculine personal name, the A ending is merely a suffix or mater. Uh, the name probably derives from the root uh, ayin bav kaf, uh, in which we would have the meaning attacker or crusher. Nice name for a, for a uh, eponymous ancestor. Here you can see uh, that the uh, city of Abil uh, Beit Ma'aka is identified with the site of uh, Tel Abil al uh, uh, Kamk, uh, a uh, large 10-hectare uh, uh, mound uh, located seven kilometers northwest of Tel Dan. Uh, the uh, first component of the name, Avail, uh, means something like brook or meadow and is often prefixed to another toponymic descriptor. Uh, uh, thus, Avel Beit Ma'aka would mean the brook or meadow of the tribal polity uh, Ma'aka. Uh, the site is currently being excavated, which uh, you just saw the excavations there. And uh, just going back, you can kind of get a little bit of a glimpse. There is a river near this um, uh, site, so it could be the reference uh, to the meadow. Um, I'm jumping way too far ahead. All right. So quickly here then, uh, the, the city became the capital of uh, the tribe of Beit Ma'aka, which was not originally Aramean. Probably like other instances, Aram was added to an already extant toponym yielding Aram Ma'aka, like Aram Nahrayim, uh, Aram Zobah, and Aram uh, Damascus. Thus, uh, Ma'aka was originally the name of an eponymous ancestor of an early West Semitic tribe that gave its name to the area which later came under Aramean control. So at the time of the biblical writer or his historical source, it was an Aramean polity. However, in the first millennium, it lost its independence. Avel Beit Ma'aka is referred to as an Israelite city in 2 Samuel 20, 1 Kings 15 and 2 Kings 15. When and how it became Israelite, we do not know. Perhaps one of the results of David's defeats of the Arameans, but this is not actually stated. Now to Tob. That Tob participated in the wars of Hadad Azer against uh, uh, David is acknowledged by most interpreters. The land of Tob is mentioned in uh, Thutmose III's toponymic list and a city of Tubu which would be Tob, uh, is mentioned in the Amarna letters, but the location of the polity is debated. Uh, a number of scholars have identified this tiny entity with uh, the modern site of uh, at uh, Tayyiba and have uh, taken it to be uh, Tob of Judges 11 and 1 Samuel 10 and Maccabees 5 and 2 Maccabees 12. Other scholars have debated this identification. However, there can be no doubt of the entity's existence based on the earlier attestations in Egyptian and Amarna text. The lack of first millennium attestations is undoubtedly the result of the polity's absorption into the kingdom of Aram Damascus. Aram Naharayim, according to 2 Samuel 10, 16, at Hadad Azer had suzerainty over the Arameans who were beyond uh, the river, okay? Also known as Aram Naharayim, what is today the modern Jazeera. Um, and so these uh, references refer to mobile pastoralist Aramean tribes just inside the great bend of the Euphrates River. Hamat. Hamat is um, uh, to be identified with modern Hama. Uh, it was an important city-state located on the Orontes River. Um, 
it uh, did not fight against David, but its king, Toe, or Tu, Tau, uh, as the Septuagint and First Chronicles 18 uh, have the name uh, spelled, paid tribute to David, uh, which he dedicated to Yahweh. Um, later in the Iron II period, Hamat was an Aramean entity under Zakur, but at this earlier period, it was ruled by a Luvian dynasty. In the 9th century, uh, uh, we have a king by the name of ur Hulina, who had a Hurian name. His son, Aratami, had a Luvian name. And the earlier king in this region, Taita, or Taita, uh, uh, who I would identify as Taita II, uh, had a Hurian name. The name Toi has been analyzed as Hurian from Tai, that is, the, uh, with the meaning man, uh, the boss man. Uh, thus, uh, the name Toi is completely consistent with what is known about the rulers of Hamat in the period of David. I also do not equate Toi with Taita as some scholars have done. Gesher. The land of Gesher is first mentioned in the Bible in Deuteronomy. It's also found in the book of Joshua uh, a number of times. It was located on the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Gesher is not mentioned in the Amarna correspondence, uh, despite a mistaken thought uh, earlier by some scholars, but is partially preserved in an inscription of Shalmaneser III. Uh, it is uh, certainly uh, uh, the excavations that at Tell, sometimes identified as Beit Seda, though I don't accept that identification, have perhaps uncovered the remains of the city itself. Here you can see some of the excavations. Gesher was not involved in David's wars due to a treaty relationship. Uh, David uh, married Maaka, the daughter of Ta Talmai, uh, the king of Gesher, early in his rule in Hebron. This is before he became king over all of Israel. David used political marriages to secure his position. This marriage gave David an ally to the north of Ishbosheth's kingdom and um, placed him in a precarious, uh, put Ishbosheth in a precarious position between Gesher and Judah. Good relations were maintained. Thus, Absalom sought asylum at Gesher under the protection of Talmai, his grandfather. These friendly relations uh, uh, indicate that Gesher was independent of Zobah in Davidic times. It is unlikely that Gesher would have been allowed to remain neutral in the war if it had been a vassal of Hadad Azer. So now, conclusion. Based on this information, one can reconstruct the history of David's wars with the Arameans as follows. First, after the outbreak of war between Amma, uh, uh, Ammon and uh, Israel, uh, the uh, Hadad Azer came to the aid of Ammon, uh, along with a number of allies and vassals, for example, uh, Maaka and Tob. And all these were defeated by the Israelites under Joab in a battle at Medabah. Uh, Hadad Azer reorganized and prepared to engage Israel again. But David marched his army northward and defeated the army of uh, Zobah under Hadad Azer's general, uh, Shobach, uh, at Chalam. Uh, Shobach was killed there. This is in uh, 2 Samuel 10. Several of Hadad Azer's allies and vassals subsequently sued for peace and became David's uh, vassals. Uh, the third and final battle occurred in Zobah, perhaps near Hamat, uh, when Hadad Azer was in the midst of attempting to re reassert power at the Euphrates. It was a decisive defeat for Hadad Azer. Since Hadad Azer was overlord of a significant portion of Syria, David's conquest may have given Israel suzerainty over this territory. During this conflict, Aram Damascus uh, makes its first appearance in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, uh, coming to the aid of Hadad Azer, it was defeated by David, who placed uh, Israelite garrisons in its territory. Later, when tiglath pileser III conquered Aram Damascus in 732, he divided it into three provinces. Subutu, that is Zobah, 
uh, Dimaska, that is Damascus, and Karnina, that is Karnayan, or Karnayim of the Bible. These functioned for the rest of the 8th century throughout the 7th century. A completely different situation is presented in the Bible where the Davidic Wars depict independent Aramean entities, Zobah, uh, Beit uh, Rehov, uh, Aram Damascus, uh, Ma'aka, Tob, Had, uh, Hamat, and Gesher. All of these, except Dam Damascus, are missing from all the sources written in the 8th to 5th centuries. Therefore, it is very likely that the biblical texts have been based on earlier sources that knew of the political situation in the very late 11th to early 10th centuries. Understanding 2 Samuel 8 and 10 as mere fabricated literary constructs denies these Aramean polities historical existence. It is one thing to be defeated by David. It is quite another to be denied any existence by a modern historian. This is just bad historiography. A better effort takes into account all the data with all of its complexity. This is what I've attempted to do. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lawson. Okay, um, we've got now Gary Rensberg. Gary's friend of the library, friend of many of us. Uh, excited to hear what he's got to say about the book of Genesis as a product of the United Monarchy. Fresh in from Rutgers. Thank you for being here. How's that? Great. Thank you, Mark. It is a great pleasure to be here at the uh, Lanier Theological Library. Thank you for your warm hospitality. Uh, and to Charles and the rest of the staff, this is my third visit to Lanier. So I now qualify to be called in Hebrew a Ben Bayat, which means literally a son of the home, uh, because I do feel very much at home every time uh, I'm here. Um, The year is 1593, CE that is, not BCE. We will get to the BCE period soon enough, but for now let us stay with 1593 CE. The scene is a tavern in London. The following seven men are seated around a table. Shakespeare, Marlowe, Johnson, Dunn, Spencer, Bacon, and Raleigh. If the movie Shakespeare in Love helps you imagine the scene, great. There on the spot, these seven men create modern English literature. What led to this moment in time in 1593 when in my little fantasy world, these seven individuals launched the great enterprise known as modern English literature? Let us review the events of the previous century. In 1476, okay, we're stuck. In 1476, William Caxton brought the first printing press to England, allowing for the easier production of books and the spread of literacy. In the 1500s, the Renaissance reached England, and with it, the rediscovery of the classics of, Greek, of Greece and Rome. The study of biblical Hebrew also flourished, especially with the establishment of the Regis Professorships of Hebrew at Oxford and Cambridge under the auspices of Henry VIII, positions which continue down to the present day. In, four, in 1588, the English defeated the Spanish Armada, and with that event, England became the dominant political and military force in Europe. It truly was an age of glory for England. Fifteen years before our seven men are sitting in the London Tavern, Francis Drake circumnavigated the globe claiming lands on distant shores for England, including present-day Northern California and Oregon. All of this created a new England. And ruling over it all was Elizabeth I, 
whose long and successful reign fostered the arts. The queen herself, in fact, could read or speak six languages, including classical Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Fun fact, Elizabeth's Hebrew tutor was Antoine Chevalier, who later would serve as Regis Professor of Hebrew in Cambridge. Her fellow student was Thomas Baudley, who would go on to found the library of the University of Oxford, which still bears his name. The connection between political power and the flowering of the arts is as well-established one in world history. Classical Greece, Imperial Rome, medieval Spain, 17th century Holland, Napoleonic France, England's second go-round under Queen Victoria, and 20th century America. The height of these countries' political and military power corresponds to the height of their artistic, creative endeavors. A new religion was a swirl in England. Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, had broken with the church in Rome and had established the new church of England. The new church became even more firmly established under his daughter Elizabeth, whose anti-Catholic stance characterized her reign. Within a year of ascending the throne, she oversaw the act of uniformity, requiring the use of the Protestant Book of Common Prayer. She removed all the Catholics from her privy council, and she established herself as the supreme governor of the Church of England. Against the backdrop of all this political, military, and religious activity stands an important event in 1576. James Burbage built England's first theater. This single act spawned the transition of plays from relatively silly little things produced at fairs or on the street to serious theatrical presentations of lasting import, making Shakespeare possible. And thus was invented modern English literature during the reign of Elizabeth I, or in my imaginary world, by the seven men, note the good biblical number, seated in a London tavern in 1593 during the heyday of Her Majesty's rule. John Dryden, writing only a century later, would refer to these writers as, quote, that great race of men who lived before the flood, unquote, employing quite felicitously a well-known biblical topos. Now, what does all of this have to do with the Bible? The comparisons with Jerusalem in the 10th century BCE are striking. There was a new polity in Israel, a monarchy, which traditionally had not been a feature of the society. In fact, quite the contrary, since according to normative Israelite theology, only God could be king, and any human king was a compromise of that tenet. For the first time, power was concentrated in a single place, Jerusalem. In contrast to traditional Israelite society, formed by a loose confederation of 12 tribes, sharing many beliefs and customs, especially the worship of one God, but otherwise retaining autonomy from one another. The establishment of a monarchy in Jerusalem brought about a new stage of social development as Israel shifted from a tribal, pastoral, and village lifestyle to a new urbanism. These major changes did not occur without opposition. The Bible records a resistance to the new monar monarchic system, first in the Book of Kings and then most forcefully in 1 Samuel 8 through the voice of the prophet Samuel. But the liberals of the day, if we can call them that, won out and Israel moved to a monarchy, first in the person of Saul, a transitionary figure, and then in complete fashion under David and Solomon, by which point human kingship was a fait accompli. When David died, there was a question as to who would uh, succeed him, but no one doubted that it would be one of his sons so quickly had kingship taken hold in Israel. Similarly, when Solomon died, the northern tribes expressed their discontent, but there was no turning back to an earlier system of governance. Thus, when the northern tribes refused to follow Rehoboam, son of Solomon, grandson of David, their only choice was to set up a rival kingdom with a parallel royal dynasty established by Jeroboam, from the tribe of Ephraim. There was also a new religious development during the 10th century BCE. Until this point, the Ark of the Covenant, the centerpiece of the Israelite cult, had been housed in the tabernacle, a tent structure, in the village of Shiloh in the territory of Ephraim. David brought the Ark to Jerusalem amidst great ceremony, and a generation later, Solomon built the temple to, build, to house the Ark. 
The temple, a structure of stone, was something totally alien to Israelite religious life. Temples of stone were features of urban life, indeed of the Canaanites. The Israelites were traditionalists with a tent-like tabernacle, portable during their wandering period, then housed in a smallish village, but by no means to, repla to be replaced by the urban wonder. In fact, the temple was so foreign to Israelite lifestyle that Solomon needed to import Phoenician architects and builders to undertake the project. The very notion of Jerusalem as the religious and administrative capital of the nation was altogether new and striking. After all, it, Jerusalem had not been an Israelite city until this point. The traditional capital was Shechem. It was the city where representatives of the 12 tribes would gather when necessary, as we see in Joshua 24, for example. Jerusalem, by contrast, had been an independent city-state of the Jebusites, but that was exactly the point. Since it had not belonged to any of the 12 tribes, and since David sought to diminish the influence of the tribes, the choice of Jerusalem was intentional. It would serve him well as the capital of the new political entity. Americans will compare the selection of Washington, D.C., belonging to, new, to no state, and parallel examples include Canberra, Australia, and Brasilia, Brazil. David built an international empire, first by quashing the Philistine threat and gaining control of remaining Canaanite pockets within the ideal boundaries of Israel, and then by conquering Moab and Ammon to the east, Edom to the southeast, and as we've just heard from Lawson Younger, Aram to the northeast, all the while securing good relations with the Phoenicians to the northwest via treaty alliance. The result was an empire stretching from the Sinai Desert in the southwest to the Euphrates River in the far northeast, or at least according to the biblical account. To return to religious issues, something even more shocking occurred during David's reign. The new king in Jerusalem, David, allowed the former Canaanite or Jebusite high priest of the city to remain in that position, even though the deity now worshipped there was Yahweh. Which is to say, numerous scholars, myself included, believe that Sadok, Zadok, was the former king and high priest of Jerusalem, of Jebusite Jerusalem. When David conquered the city, he stripped Sadok of his civil authority as king of the city, but he permitted him to retain his religious authority as high priest over the cult of the city, again, one now devoted to the worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel. How to get the people to go along with all these major drastic changes of the 10th century? Monarchy, an international empire, the centrality of Jerusalem, Zadok as priest. The answer is, write a national epic incorporating all of the earlier traditions back to Abraham and embed into that narrative anticip anticipations of, of the present. That is to say, there is a social, religious, and indeed political message in the book of Genesis. Or in other words, tell the story about the past but reflect upon the present. This was the major accomplishment of the anonymous authors in Jerusalem who created the book of Genesis to be dated, in my opinion, to the 10th century BCE. Let us turn to some specific examples in defense of my hypothesis. The first is God's promise to Abraham that kings shall stem from him and from Sarah in Genesis chapter 17. Through these passages, our author instructs the reader, do not oppose kingship, it is God's will. Second, the boundaries of the land of Canaan promised to Abraham in Genesis 15 from the river of Egypt, most likely this refers to the Wadi El Arish, to the Euphrates River match the extent of the Davidic Solomonic Empire. Uh, at an earlier time, an Israelite could only have laughed at such an idea of an empire this size, for Israel was a very minor player in the geopolitics of the 12th and 11th centuries. And after the death of Solomon, the empire collapsed, never again to be realized. The third verse is the emphasis, or the third item, is the emphasis placed on Judah in the book of Genesis, especially Jacob's deathbed words to his fourth son 
in Genesis chapter 49. The dying patriarch describes Judah in royal terms. His brothers shall bow down to him and tribute shall come to him. In addition, Judah is the most noble of the brothers in the Joseph story. It is his long speech in Genesis 44 that brings Joseph to tears to reveal himself to his brothers. These three items converge to demonstrate that the book of Genesis, or at least its greatest part, derives from the 10th century. The anonymous author responsible for this masterpiece of literature told the story of Israel's patriarchs, but that story is at all times refracted through the prism of the present. God approves kingship, which is to reside within the tribe of Judah, and the boundaries of the realm were preordained in hoary antiquity. Or to put this in other terms, the story of the patriarchs is narrated, but the shadow of David and Solomon is evident throughout. This technique is well known in world literature. The best example from our country is Arthur Miller's The Crucible, which narrates the past, specifically the Salem witch trials of late 17th century Massachusetts, but echoes the present with specific reference to the McCarthyism of the 1950s of which Miller himself was a victim. Or to take an example from film, the movie MASH, released in 1969, tells the story of American troops during the Korean War, but in essence it is about another land war in Asia, the one still raging at that time, the one in Vietnam. Finally, let us recall that Shakespeare's histories tell the lives of earlier kings, but at the same time are informed by the English monarchy of his own day, illustrated best, perhaps, by Richard II. Having established the main point about Genesis and its connection to the Jerusalem court of Kings David and Solomon, let us look at additional details in the text that support our hypothesis. As noted, David established his rule over the small kingdoms to the east. The author of Genesis reflects this, excuse me, by, um, uh, by relating the ancestors of these nations to the family of Abraham. Moab and Ammon are descended from Abraham's nephew Lot, while Edom is descended from Abraham's grandson Esau. In addition, note that Isaac's blessing to Esau in Genesis 27 foretells a time when Esau, that is to say Edom, will throw off the yoke of his brother, that is to say Israel exactly as 1 Kings 11 records in detail how Edom rebelled against Solomon towards the end of his reign. Jerusalem is alluded to in the book of Genesis in several places. Consider Genesis 14, 18, with our attention drawn to Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, short for Jerusalem. This episode includes the important detail that Abram tithes to Melchizedek, the message for someone in 10th century BCE Israel is clear. Do not object to tithing to the new Canaanite king priest who supervises the cult in Jerusalem, namely Zadok, for it is something that Father Abraham did in the distant past already to Melchizedek. And note that the two names of these two figures include the same root, Tzadi Dalat Kof, Tzadak, to be righteous, thereby further solidifying the connection. A more subtle reference to Jerusalem occurs in Genesis 22 in the famous story of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. Here we encounter the earliest reference in the Bible to the expression Har Adonai, the Mount of the Lord, which in every other attestation refers unambiguously to Jerusalem or Mount Zion. Later Jewish tradition would make this explicit, claiming that Mount Moriah is the spot on which the temple was built. The author of Genesis 22 makes the same point, but much more subtly. Moreover, while Abraham builds altars in a variety of locations throughout the narrative, only here in Genesis 22 does he sacrifice. The point could not be clearer. The ram caught in the thicket would be but the first of countless rams sacrificed on that spot. The third allusion to Jerusalem in Genesis is the mention of the Gihon Spring, in Genesis 2 as one of the rivers of Eden. This is the name of the large spring in Jerusalem, as Jane discussed earlier, the city's largest water source by far, 
whose presence makes life in that place possible. We must, of course, disregard the geographical impossibility of the confluence of the Tigris, Euphrates, and the Gihon, but that is beside the point. We are dealing here with the transfiguration of a myth which has the great life-giving water sources of the world flowing together, including the main water source of Jerusalem. The author of Genesis, faced with a people unaccustomed to ascribing any special quality to the city, embedded into his narrative these passages, the Melchizedek episode, the reference to the Mount of the Lord, and the mention of the Gihon, in order to demonstrate the centrality of Jerusalem. A dominant theme in Genesis perceived by everyone who reads that book is the motif of the younger son. This is Lawson Younger's favorite part of the Bible. What lies behind this repeated motif? To my mind, these stories are a reflection of David as the youngest son of Jesse and of Solomon as the youngest son of David. The author wishes us to know God indeed favors the younger or the youngest son. Yet another theme that dominates Genesis is fraternal strife. Once more, we can point to the present conditions of 10th century BCE as the background for this motif. In fact, in a rather severe way, because Absalom kills Amnon and Solomon arranges for the killing of Adonijah. Moreover, the familiar tale of Cain and Abel now comes into greater focus. For a very specific lexical item connects this story uh, to the book of Samuel. Note that Cain kills Abel Basadeh in the field. The same word occurs as occurs in the mouth of the wise woman of Tekoa in her elusive account to Absalom's slaying of Amnon. All of this evidence, to my mind, demonstrates that the book of Genesis is a product of the 10th, of 10th century Jerusalem. The author or authors narrate the past, but the composition reflects the present. William Faulkner was absolutely correct. The past is never dead. It's not even past. I began this talk with my imagined London tavern scene. Let me conclude accordingly with something real, namely the reality of what transpired in Concord, Massachusetts during the 19th century. Living in the same small village where Emerson Thoreau, Hawthorne Channing, Bronson Alcott, and his more famous daughter, Louisa May, the core individuals of the Transcendentalist movement and their fellow literary travelers. Living nearby in other towns or in Boston proper were Fuller, Peabody, and Longfellow, lifelong friend of Hawthorne. The lives of these individuals reached others, including Melville, Whitman, Greeley, and Mann. Note that Melville dedicated Moby Dick to Hawthorne, while Horace Mann was Hawthorne's brother-in-law. Without diminishing the work and influence of others, one may rightly claim that this remarkable group of writers created American literature during the middle of the 19th century. In fact, one may make an even greater claim, they created America. Consider, for example, Emerson's poem, Conquered Him, and Longfellow's poem, Paul Revere's Ride, with their evocations of the Revolutionary War. What led to this moment in time in the middle of the 19th century which allowed for this circle of people to create the great, great enterprise known as American literature, simply stated the United States was coming of age, and with this advance came its new natural, national literature centered in Concord, Massachusetts. Due to the anonymous nature of ancient Israelite literature and Near Eastern literature more generally, we cannot know the names of the individuals responsible for the creation of the book of Genesis. But in some way, I like to imagine a circle of individuals akin to our friends in a London tavern or to the transcendentalists and their literary heirs in 19th century Concord. And these individuals during the 10th century BCE collectively created the national literature at the heart of ancient Israel. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Okay, looking at our time, we've got time for uh, Professor Garfinkel to come up and to give some thoughts if he's got. Uh, I would think that some of this may have stirred some ideas. Where do I, ah, there you are, Yossi, thank you. Um, how would you like to best do this? Would you like to go up there? Would you like to stand here? I like to sit here. You like to sit here, you sit here, that would be perfect. And. Um,
Hello, do you hear me? So first of all, I really would like to thank Mark Lanier for this uh, wonderful event. I'm in the first time here, and uh, it's really extremely uh, impressive. I also like to uh, thank the staff that took care of me and organized my visit, not only here, but also to Dallas and uh, also to uh, Lubbock. <coughs> so this was really quite a lot of uh, work for them. And then I want to thank the, the six uh, lectures, or the lecturer, which did a great uh, job here today. And all the time I was thinking, I can, how can I combine all these six uh, wonderful lectures into, together? You know, it was really, uh, no, it's not really possible. And if I start going lecture by lecture, yes, then it will be very boring for you. So I want to put this whole event in the context. And the context is the relationship between the Bible, the biblical text on the one hand, and ancient Near Studies on the other hand. And from ve the very beginning, we can see that we have a kind of love-hate relationships. Already in the middle of the 19th century, we can see a lot of uh, wonderful discoveries. Layard worked in Nineveh, and he found the Sennacherib relief that described uh, Lachish, and this event is, is described also in the biblical tradition in three different books. Then we have the Mesha Stila, and we have the uh, Silwan Talit inscription, and all these things fit very nicely into the biblical text. So it really looks like, that's it, the Bible, and archaeology, everything fits perfectly with each other. And then about 117 years ago, uh, uh, a German scholar, he was a Jew, but he converted to uh, Christianity. His name was uh, Friedrich Delisch, and he came with a very famous lecture Bibel und Babel, okay? Bibel und Babel, Bibel Zatana, it's Bible, and Bibel Babel, okay? And he came, look, we have Gilgamesh, and we have all kinds of stories, from, and, and the Hammurabi codes, and things like this, and the Bible is just something not so important, and uh, just a small part of the culture of the ancient Near East. So it was a kind of, uh, if you look at the pendulum, first the pendulum went to where the biblical text, and, and then he tried to put everything to the other direction. So, <clears throat> few, a generation or so later, we have the uh, beginning of what we call biblical archaeology with Albright, which has tremendous influence on the field. And then we have the big excavations that took place between the two world wars, like the excavation of the Oriental Institute in uh, Megiddo, and other excavation at Bechan and Lachish, Jerusalem, and the uh, other site. And again, Albert summarized these things and he said, discovery after discovery, proving the Bible. <laughs> okay, so this was again going to this direction. And then Igel Yadin, Avram Alamat, Chaim Tadmor, all these great scholars that many of their libraries are not far away from here, work in this concept that Bible and archaeology and things are connected very nice with each other. And what happens that in the early uh, 80s, this is almost 40 years ago, with the development of uh, postmodern uh, approaches, we can see again that the pendulum went to the other direction. Uh, the Copenhagen School, Israel Finkelstein, that was mentioned here, and many other scholars. And they said, well, Abraham is in mythology, Exodus is in mythology, David and Solomon are mythology, there was no temple in Jerusalem, Salom, uh, Rehoboam fortification, and so on and so forth. Where did they stop? Where they, what was standing like a rock that could not be uh, denied? At least according to Judah. Lachish. Lachish level three, Sennacherib campaign, which is mentioned in the biblical text, in uh, the Sennacherib relief, and also uh, the excavation of Lachish, the site of Lachish. Everything was very clear. So many of them would say, okay, the biblical history of Judah starting only at 701, at the end of the 8th century BC. So this was, the pendulum went to this direction. And <clears throat> then came the Tel Dan Stila. And then, but of course, nobody wants to say I was wrong. <laughs> and so there was a bypass. There was no chronology idea that, uh, uh, okay, there was David. Steve Ortiz all relate to this a lot. So there was David, but he was just a Bedouin sheikh living in a tent, and there was no kingdom, no fortification, no writing, and no administration. 
<coughs> and this uh, idea uh, was uh, uh, people <coughs> make uh, so so first uh, sorry in the begin or after <coughs> the first stage of the minimalist was to say that everything is mythological, but when the Tel Dan Stila was found, he said okay, but chronology is working to our favor, and there was nothing in Judah at the time. And then came an old project where 400 radiocarbon dating were sent, sample of uh, seed were sent for radiocarbon dating, and uh, these were sent from running excavation, because you cannot just take olive peat from excavation from many years ago. They need to be excavated properly, so you know the context and, and where they came from. And there was an article that summarized the result of 400 uh, olive peats and uh, chocolate and uh, seeds that were sampled. And what were the results? Shocking results. Urbanism started in the Kingdom of Israel at a, in, the eight, in the 9th century BC. So it really seemed like everything lost. The pendulum will not go anymore to the other direction because we have scientific proof, radiocarbon dating. What can be better than that? And then came the site of Ribet Kayafa, which I excavated, and I will talk about it uh, tomorrow. And we have uh, just a few olive pits that were sent from this site, and the date was 1000 BC. And then people from the low chronology paradigm said, well, we have 400, so what is the few samples that you have? But the whole point is that if you check the geography, the 400 sample came from site in the north, okay, in uh, Dan, in not done, but in Chatz, from Chatzor, and Dor, and uh, Tel Rehov, and other sites which are not in Judah. So all these 400 samples basically telling us that the Kingdom of Israel started, or urbanism in the Kingdom of Israel started in the 9th century, but not in Judah. And what's happened is that I work in Judah in the last 10 years, we have beautiful radiocarbon dating from early 10th century from two sites, Chirbet Kayafa and uh, Arai. And from the site of Lachis, that we also excavated for five years, we also have date from the 10th century, but not the early part, the later part. And this also, if you remember the biblical tradition, fitting nice with the tradition about Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, that fortified 15 cities in Lachish, including uh, 45 cities in Judah, including Lachish. So you can see that the pendulum is going, going uh, to <coughs> this direction. And the result of Steve, the Gezer, and radiocarbon date from Gezer supporting it. Jerusalem, I don't know, it's the most horrible site in the world. I will never excavate in Jerusalem. <laughs> if I will excavate Jerusalem, I will, for my left hand will be whatever. As a student, but as an archaeologist, I will never go to. I work in the city of David together with Jane. So I work the one season. But as archaeologist, I'm not going to. It's a horrible site. I, I can't imagine a more horrible site than Jerusalem. So <clears throat> that's the way I think that the pendulum, sometimes it's going to this direction, sometimes it's going to this direction. If you are a minimalist and it's going to the other direction, you are frustrated. If you are more uh, conservative and it's going to the minimalist direction, then you are unhappy. And these pendulums, you know, every 50 years going to the other direction. And then some people are happy, some people are unhappy. I think that the people in this uh, chapel now are quite happy with the, the new developments. Thank you. Thank you very much.